Welcome to uh, the January 2024 meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Ast Astronomical Society. And a few things have happened since we last met, given that the uh, last uh, meeting was back in uh, November. Um, we've had uh, NASA announce their new uh, supersonic uh, X-59 plane that's called Quest, spelt with a double S. And uh, no, uh, no surprises as to what the double S stands for, it's uh, supersonic. And that actually came from Lockheed Martin's uh, Skunk Works, which is uh, the one where usually top secret uh, aircraft are uh, developed. And that's been under development now for over 10 years, cost a quarter of a billion dollars so far just to get to uh, this level. And it flies supersonic, but uh, has virtually no sonic boom to it at all, which is the uh, highly unusual aspect of it. Um, they, uh, they said uh, at, at best it'll be a little thump you'll hear rather than a, uh, a boom as it goes over. And the plans are to uh, commercialise it, uh, turn it into a passenger aircraft, uh, but first of all they're going to test it over some American cities to see how many people can c complain. Because uh, that was what uh, happened to uh, Concorde when it uh, first uh, started uh, travelling to America. There was a lot of uh, problems with its uh, sonic boom and the Americans being the uh, litiginous bunch that they are, uh, didn't uh, particularly like those uh, sonic booms. So this one uh, could potentially be uh, quite different. Now you'll notice its cockpit is about halfway down the fuselage in the middle, plus um, there's no forward facing windows of it. So the pilot inside is relying entirely on 4K resolution um, uh, video screen to actually see forward uh, in the plane as it is. Uh, the engines are on top, as you'll, you'll notice at the back there, and also underneath is uh, completely smooth when they, uh, they pull the, uh, the undercarriage up. So um, they're very proudly uh, announcing this one. So it remains to be seen whether or not that, uh, that turns uh, into uh, something commercial. That one, can, of course, can only fit one person in it. So um, to scale it up to something like the size of a jumbo jet or that is uh, still uh, quite a, a big uh, hurdle away, I would have thought. Uh, we also had the uh, $1 coin released by the Royal Australian Mint uh, for uh, Australia's uh, uh, contribution over the years uh, in space. And that'll officially be released around the 31st of January. They struck a few that went to uh, 100 lucky ones uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you would have seen the, uh, the message that, uh, that went out about that. Uh, so if you, you want those, you can actually pre-order them now uh, online for, uh, for, the, uh, for that in, in terms of uh, the pack. So it's a $1 coin. First one with uh, uh, King Charles on uh, the reverse as well. Uh, over on the right-hand side, we have the Australian National University has uh, successfully trialled a brand new technology for uh, satellite thrusters called the uh, Bogong Th Thruster. And uh, you'll notice the picture there of a, a Bogon moth on it. And the idea is the moth uh, sort of pushes the satellite a bit uh, in, in the orbit. No, no, it's not really. It's because the propellant it uses is uh, actually naphthalene. And uh, most people will know naphthalene as being mothballs. And what they do is they heat that mothball up to about the uh, temperature of the cuppa that uh, those who have their drink in here uh, uh, have at the moment. And when that happens, naphthalene doesn't melt, it turns into a vapour, so it sublimes. And then uh, that's thrown out um, the, uh, the nozzle at uh, the back, and they've successfully used that to uh, steer satellites. So in other words, you're not talking about major thrust for lifting a rocket off the ground. This is more station keeping of uh, satellites when they're up and uh, pretty close to where they're meant to be in their uh, particular orbit. So uh, that's why they called it the Bogon Thruster, was because of the, uh, the moth um, connection. Uh, down at the uh, bottom left, we had uh, uh, SpaceX's uh, Elon Musk's uh, Starship uh, second flight uh, back in November that uh, failed a few minutes after it uh, took off. And the postmortem of that uh, showed that they'd actually dumped uh, liquid oxygen um, to compensate for no payload. Now, they didn't actually say whether that was a manual fault or whether it was uh, automatically done. I suspect it was probably automatically done. And unfortunately, when they dumped the liquid oxygen, liquid oxygen is extremely flammable, and it uh, did indeed burn and go bang. And that's why the thing went bang. And um, so, uh, yeah, li li liquid oxygen is not, uh, not something to uh, mess around with. 
And uh, down at the uh, bottom right-hand side there, the uh, second Artemis launch to the moon. If you remember, the uh, first one uh, last year uh, was uh, unmanned and uh, went uh, around the moon and stayed there for uh, many days before coming back. Uh, they've now postponed uh, Artemis II, which was going to be the first one with a crew on board, including first woman and first person of colour, I believe was the term that they used. They've now postponed it about a year until uh, September 2025. Uh, only because they, they found a few little problems with life support and ventilation and heat shield issues and things like that that the crew wouldn't be too happy about if they didn't actually solve. So no, no, no one uh, has actually been complaining about that, um, at least from the astronaut uh, corps. So that's, uh, that's been uh, delayed a little bit. So tonight we welcome, uh, if there's any new uh, members here, uh, looking around the room, I don't think there are. Um, I'll, as usual, we'll go through the events of uh, previous uh, months and uh, coming month. Uh, then I'll throw over to Chris for uh, the photo challenge, then Guido for Sky for the month. And uh, Eden's here to tell us all about the theory of everything. And uh, then we'll look at uh, why we haven't actually found any aliens. So uh, that particular one goes for uh, about uh, 50 minutes, but there's about half an hour of questions uh, that actually follow that particular uh, uh, talk. And uh, over on the right-hand side, those who have ever done any uh, data modelling in IT will recognise some of the symbology uh, symbols there. And uh, those funny little things that looks like uh, crow's feet indicate a one is to many uh, relationships. So that says a grandparent may have one or more parents who are their children and a parent may have one or more uh, children. And the thing on the right-hand side is the entire universe. So you see that thing with a little um, crow's feet wrapping round onto itself. That's uh, how uh, IT data modelers represent everything in the universe in just the, uh, the one symbol. So recent events, we uh, had, uh, thinking way back now to November, distant memory, we had a working bee. We had uh, Vastrock uh, come and go with 82 there. Uh, there was a committee meeting uh, followed uh, shortly on uh, after that. Then uh, the first uh, public night in December, where Trevor had to encounter 100% cloud and we had a reduced attendance there mainly because of the weather. Then uh, a week later we had the Christmas Star concert which is the picture in the background shown on that slide. Again, 100% cloud. Uh, then the very next day we had uh, the, um, the neurodiverse uh, group uh, came along and uh, put up listening to me for an hour and a half so they did uh, really, really well under 100% cloud. Uh, a week later, we had uh, 70 members here for the Christmas dinner, uh, then uh, straight into the public nights for uh, January. The first one was given by uh, Guido with uh, no cloud, so that's always uh, very welcome, uh, particularly that close to Christmas. Um, and simultaneously, we had uh, some uh, members go up to Mount Buller for a collaboration public night, uh, up, actually up on top of Mount Buller. And um, one of the members who's also a member of uh, Astronomical Society of Geelong, Kelly, I think, uh, gave uh, a sky, sky talk from memory from what I saw. Uh, 6th of January, Gita gave uh, the second talk, which is a Saturday. So we sort of had a bit of an experiment this year to go for the first Friday and the Saturday closest to Christmas. And it uh, turned out that the Saturday didn't uh, deter people at all. So we had uh, 81 turn up, even though it was 95% cloud. Uh, then a week later, Catherine and I uh, had the public night here as well. We had no cloud on that one and uh, a good turnout as well, 87. So coming up soon, uh, this uh, Friday night, uh, Manfred uh, is uh, giving the talk and the public night. We had 95, I think it's down to 94, I think uh, Nerida was saying uh, before. Um, so uh, it should be pretty full if uh, the weather is kind. If it's not kind, you might have some of those that are coming a long distance decide uh, not to turn up on the night. Um, on uh, the uh, 20th of January, which is uh, this Saturday, the working bees on, and Greg's going to be running the observatory training at 8, eight o'clock, was it? Yeah, 8 o'clock uh, that night for any members that wish to uh, learn more about uh, the observatory and uh, the instruments down there. Committee meeting is next uh, Tuesday via Zoom. Um, Eden and uh, Brian have the uh, cosmology discovery group uh, on the uh, 27th, which is uh, a Saturday here at uh, the Briars. Then uh, the first uh, public night uh, in February is uh, given by Trevor. He's still, I think, uh, overseas uh, on, um, on a cruise ship, but he'll be back by then and um, ready to go for another year. 
Uh, we don't have a public night in March as things stand at the moment because we won't have a road to actually get access up to here, so we've called it off uh, for the uh, March public night, so um, only, only because of all the roadworks, and you would have passed uh, some of that going on at the, uh, at the small bridge on the way up uh, tonight. Uh, 17th of February, we've got a couple of things on. Uh, the main thing that night is the trivia night. Um, with uh, Dave uh, looking after that one with the Cranbourne Lions concert band and you have to book that online and try booking uh, if uh, you wish to come and uh, earlier in the day there's going to be about an hour and a half I think uh, for the astrophotography group uh, is uh, having a, an inaugural meeting here at, uh, at the Briars and uh, I think Russell Smith was able to come on that day wasn't he and yeah uh, and then the next meeting is on the 21st. Now, down in the little orange box is um, some feedback we had from one of the uh, um, public nights uh, recently, and very, very nice uh, feedback it is from uh, one family that uh, turned up uh, to it. And uh, we're hard to go, go home afterwards. Thank you and welcome to um, AstroMofo for the first, oh well, for the end of last year. Uh, the last one that we had was, uh, so this is the photography challenge where members are tasked with uh, capturing different objects of different themes and the last theme was uh, Christmas stars. Uh, so anything that is Christmassy that you see in the sky, um, photograph it and send it in. Um, the first, I'll start off here with the first one I've got is uh, Alpha Orionis or uh, Betelgeuse. Um, it's not a candidate for the Christmas star, so to speak, but um, it is a nice bright star which I thought I'd capture with a new telescope that I bought. So this is with a 200 mil Newtonian. Um, so, um, like I said, this is not a candidate for the Christmas star, but it is due to go uh, supernova sometime soon, meaning in the next, I don't know, couple of dozen years or next few thousand years, cosmically soon. Uh, and it'll leave behind a neutron star when it does that. So it'll be pretty spectacular when it happens. Uh, and supernovas are candidates for what is thought to have been possibly the Christmas star. Um, next. There we go. Uh, another one is uh, Sirius, also captured by myself. Um, and I'll just mention this uh, challenge was completed by myself, David Rolf, Kelly Clitheroe, and Guido Tack. Uh, so Alpha Canis Majoris is uh, also known as the dog star in the constellation of um, Canis Major. Um, it's all made up of two components, Sirius A and Sirius B. Um, and this is also captured with a Newtonian and a five times uh, power mate. So this is at about a focal length of about five meters. Um, uh, and what I was able to do was also capture Sirius B as well, which is a white dwarf companion to Sirius A. And that is it right in there. So um, uh, the, the main image the, that you see up here is uh, Sirius A. You, you can only see Sirius A. It's around about a 30 second exposure and to capture to image uh, Sirius B I used um, a much shorter exposure time of about 0.2 seconds and the much shorter exposure time reveals the, the white dwarf companion over there. Um, okay, so as I said, uh, Sirius is commonly known as the dog star, and Sirius A and B together are usually referred to as the dog and pup. Um, and their orbit is around about 20 astronomical units, so it's not too distant. They're about the same distance as the Sun and Uranus or so, something like that. Um, and at the moment, it's a good time to try and see it if you can. Visually, it's really hard to see because they're only about 11 arc seconds apart and you need a pretty powerful telescope, you also need really good seeing to be able to view it through an eyepiece. So you need something like at least 200 or 300 times magnification to be able to see it and really stable uh, seeing in a stable atmosphere. Okay, so just another fun fact, um, Sirius A, which you see there, is around about the same diameter as Earth, maybe about a thousand kilometers less. So that is what something the size of the Earth looks like from about eight light years away. Uh, next one is another one that I caught with a new toy, which is the Angel Nebula. Um, so the Angel Nebula is actually, I think, that little bit of it up there. Um, and this is in um, uh, the con just out, it's just in the constellation of um, Monokeros, the unicorn. Um, and it's, you can see it just, uh, you can see Orion just 
over here, the three stars of Orion and Orion's belt, and that's where the Angel Nebula is. So it's a pretty faint object, and this is around about 550 minutes of exposure time. So it is actually pretty faint to, to capture. Uh, next, we've got the Christmas Tree Beetle by Dave Rolf. Um, some of you might know it by the Crab Nebula. Um, and uh, this was imaged by, with his, I'm thinking, 130 refractor. Doesn't matter. Uh, uh, now, this uh, is also relevant, not just because it looks like a Christmas beetle, but also because it's a supernova remnant. Um, and supernova is possibly what the story is that the Christmas star may have been. It appeared in the sky for a brief period of time and then disappeared. Um, uh, but it wouldn't have been this supernova. This one exploded in around about 1054, and it was actually um, described by Chinese astronomers as a guest star at the time. And they have actually imaged the neutron star that was left behind in the middle of that um, nebula by the Chandra Observatory. So if you get a chance to look up that image, it's pretty spectacular. You can actually see the neutron star and the, the gas and everything whirling around. It's pretty nice. Uh, next, we've got some Christmas trees. And this one was by Guido Tack, uh, the Christmas tree cluster and the cone nebula. So Christmas tree, you can see the nebula looks a bit like a tree and the star cluster within it is referred to the Christmas tree cluster. And the cone nebula is the dark nebula that's right up the top of the tree, up there, and that star there is known as the tree topper. Um, so this is also in uh, Monokeros as well, um, in the constellation, it, and it's pretty close to um, Orion. So it's a similar spot to where the uh, angel nebula is. And another one captured by Kelly Clithero as well, I think, which I think is a narrowband image. And she manages to capture a lot of the, um, the dirt and dust and debris around it as well. And that area of the sky is actually pretty dusty and dirty. It's got the, um, the uh, molecular clouds around there, the Monocoros molecular, molecular clouds, which are a bu bunch of dirt and dust, planet forming regions and that sort of thing. And you can see here, that's where that is right there, right at the foot of one of the, um, the twins, the Gemini twins, um, and just next to Orion's club. Uh, next. All right, uh, next challenge. Uh, so the next challenge will be shooting the darkness. Um, dark nebulas, nebulae, uh, the horsehead, the coal sack, and the, or the boogeyman nebula. Uh, you might not have heard of the boogeyman nebula, but it's in um, Orion, the... Uh, what's the ring around the Orion Nebula? Barnard. Barnard's Loop, yes. Uh, so if we go back here, um, you've got Barnard's Loop sort of stretching around there, and the Boogeyman is just sort of just in the bottom region of it, around about there somewhere. It's a dark nebula in the Barnard's Loop that looks like a bit of a Boogeyman. So um, that's one option. Uh, other dark nebulas that we can find are in the uh, Barnard's Catalog, but, uh, of objects, there's a lot of dark nebulas in that, and also Lynn's dark nebula catalog as well. Uh, that's got a few dark uh, nebulas in there to be able to image as well. And this is one that I'd captured previously with the little snake nebula. Uh, and as Peter mentioned as well, the astrophotography group has got our inaugural get together, workshop, meeting. Um, so Russell Smith um, has generously offered to demonstrate planetary processing and photography for us. So he'll be going through a workflow to show us how he processes his image and to get really good ones. And they'll be a lot better than the one that's there because that's just one of mine, not one of Russell's. So hopefully I'll be able to show you a better version of that after the workshop. But that's happening at the Bryars here. It's before the um, trivia night. So starting at around about 2.30 and we'll run till about four o'clock. And it's obviously a free meeting for members. Um, and you can check the Facebook page or the uh, eScorpius for more details about that. Or if you've got any questions, just come and see me about it. And that's it. So we have Sky for the month for um, January and February this year. Um, I always take the the image from the current uh, magazine article. So um, Nick managed to um, take a really nice one there. Um, 
yeah, just just check out the magazine articles because they always have nice photos like that. Um, okay, so let's start with an overview of um, our solar system. So this is on, I think this is on the 15th of January. So is that around today, right? I'm, I've lost track of the date. Um, so this is where we are at the moment. We've got Earth um, there at the top. And then um, we have, I'll just try my laser pointer here. So we've got Earth up here um, and the sun back here. So what we could see is that any, anything that's on this side um, of us and of the sun is um, a morning ob object at the moment. And we'll see that in a second. So all of the inner planets, Mercury and Venus, as well as Mars, are currently morning objects. But Mars has returned from behind the sun, so we'll be able to see it again. Um, so if we fast forward this a little bit uh, by about a month, um, we'll see how we will now start to catch up with Mercury and Venus. Uh, sorry, they are going away from us while we are catching up with Mars, right? So the inner planets are moving faster than us in their orbits and Mars is moving slower. So we will start catching up with Mars so it'll become um, a bit better visible over the next few months while Mercury and Venus are starting to disappear um, behind the sun. All right, so this is now the start of February and um, I think this will go until the 15th, uh, so until mid of um, next month. Um, so let's just wait a few seconds for that and then we'll zoom out and see where the outer planets are currently at. Um, unfortunately, that's all a bit disappointing at the moment, so we'll see that Saturn by the 15th or 16th of February will be pretty much behind the sun, um, while Jupiter is still visible, so anything again, anything on this side here is in the evening sky, anything on this side is in the morning sky, anything that's behind the sun obviously is um, not visible to us at the moment. Okay, I try to use something that looks a bit like an all-sky camera for, uh, for the visualization here. So this is um, on the 1st of February, so we can see M Mercury, Mars and Venus there ahead of the sun. Um, so we're heading towards sunset around, I think, 9 p.m. or so. Um, then let's have a look at the sky uh, just after sunset on the, on the 1st of February. So we'll see that Saturn is quite low in the sky, so we, we might still be able to get a glimpse um, just um, after sunset. Um, and then the other planets, Neptune, um, Jupiter and Uranus, are still up in the sky. But Saturn is heading towards its conjunction on the 29th of February. Neptune is setting around 10 p.m., um, also heading for a conjunction in March, so will also be behind the sun. Jupiter will be around 30 degrees altitude um, around sunset, setting around midnight, but still pretty low in the, uh, in the western sky, heading for conjunction in May, so that will also disappear from view for a while. And then Uranus setting around midnight, also heading for a conjunction in May. So as you can see, um, there's not much, not, much, not, not much to see with the planets for the next couple of months, unfortunately. Um, so hopefully for the next public night, we'll, st we'll still at, at least get, get a view of Jupiter and um, uh, maybe Saturn at the, at the start of the night. All right, if we just um, continue through the night, you can see that this is kind of what the night sky uh, will look like in February. So we'll have the Milky Way really, so this is, I think, around midnight now, the Milky Way go right across the sky, uh, pretty high up, um, and um, we'll have well, Orion in the um, in the northwest, and then um, the Southern Cross in the southeast as the two kind of ends of the of the Milky Way, and then all of the Milky Way in, in between that. Uh, we'll have a, another look at that in, in a second. But let's just continue this um, until um, sunrise. So on the 2nd of February now, in the early morning. Um, we will have a bit of a moon in the sky, but then um, we will see that Venus now is um, a bright morning object. So it rises um, quite a few hours before the sun. So this is around 5 a.m. now. And Mars and Mercury will also be um, close together around there. So we should be able to get um, at least a look at Mars now. Mer Mercury will be 
um, pretty close to the sun and, and, and in the kind of early morning twilight. Um, but as I said earlier, Mars will now start to actually um, rise earlier and earlier every night. And it is heading for opposition, I think, maybe in about a year, I think in January next, next year. Um, but apparently it, it won't be a very spectacular opposition this time because it'll be, it'll be quite far away from the Earth at that point. I mean, because it's not at its closest um, to us in its orbit at that time. All right, so Mars is reappearing from conjunction and on the 22nd of February, uh, from the 22nd to the 24th, it'll be within one degree from, from Venus. So that might actually be a nice thing um, to look at in the, in the morning sky. Mercury is a morning object heading for its inferior conjunction. So that means it passes between us and the sun um, on the 28th of February. And then we have the moon in the sky there as well. Um, the next full moon is on the 26th of this month. And then we have a new moon on the 10th of February and a full moon again on the 24th um, of February. Okay, so let's have a look at the night sky again from a slightly different perspective so we can get an idea of where the constellations are at the moment. So starting from the north, um, you can see here, again, this is on the, on the 1st of February. You can see um, that we have um, Jupiter and Uranus there um, low in the sky in the, north, uh, in the northwest. We have Taurus and Orion there. Um, with the Pleiades and, um, and um, Aldebaran and, and then the, the bright stars of Orion up here. If we then follow that to, um, to the east, we can see um, Canis Major um, up here with Sirius, which um, Chris talked about. And so we basically have Orion, Canis Major, and Canis Minor, so the, the hunter and his two dogs um, up in the sky there. Um, and then moving to the southeast and the south, you can see the Milky Way stretching all the way down to, well, through um, Vela, the, the, the sail, and, um, and Carina, and then down to Crux, um, our Southern Cross down here. Um, if we zoom in a little bit here, you can see that the Magellanic Clouds, the large Magellanic Cloud up here and the small Magellanic Cloud up there, um, are actually in a quite nice position to view at the moment um, around 10 p.m. Um, on, the, on the 1st of February. So the large Magellanic Cloud is actually quite, quite high up in the sky. And the small Magellanic Cloud, as well as 47 Tucane, the nice um, globular cluster next to it, um, are still also um, quite in a nice position to view um, around this time. So those are probably good objects um, to target um, over, the next, over the next month or so. Okay, the size of the planets, um, most of them are not that relevant because we can't actually see them because they, they're hiding behind the sun. <laughs> and you can see all of them are pretty small at the moment. So um, compared to previous months, Saturn has actually moved um, away from us quite a bit. Jupiter is still reasonably large and bright, um, but also Mars is absolutely tiny at the moment now that it's uh, reappearing from, from behind the sun. Um, we have a couple of comets that might be visible. So um, the comments that I could find in um, the Almanac were these three here. So 103P Hartley 2 um, rising after twilight in the evening, but it's currently fading from magnitude 11 to 13, so not very, not very bright. We have 144P Kushida in Taurus, low in the northern sky, but at least that one is still magnitude 9 to 10, so maybe a bit easier target. And it's close to the Hyades and Aldebaran on the 10th of um, February. And then, again, I'm not going to try and pronounce the name, the 62P comet, rising around 11 p.m. Um, and over the next month passing through Leo, Virgo, and fading from magnitude 7 to 9, but at, at, um, at least still at a reasonable um, brightness at the moment. And that one will be close to the Virgo cluster galaxies during that time. So that might again be a nice opportunity to, to take um, images. Uh, and another three comets, um, the C2021 S3 pan stars rising around midnight, a magnitude nine crossing all kinds of constellations over the next month. Um, 
C2022 L2 Atlas rising late evening in the southeast, um, magnitude 12, so again, um, a slightly fainter one, and then 13P Albus setting around tw um, just after midnight and um, a bit earlier towards the end of February, and also just um, magnitude 12. But, but all of these are in the sky um, at the moment. And we've got one meteor shower, the Alpha Centaurids. Um, they are, they appear to come from close to Alpha Centauri, right? So just um, one of the one of the two pointer stars, so from from that region. Um, and they are active between the end of January until the 20th of um, February, peaking around the 9th of um, February. And um, you might remember that this is around the new moon on the 10th of February. So that's actually a really good opportunity. And um, according to the almanac, at least, these should be producing bright yellow and blue fireballs with long-lasting trains, and the radiant is above the horizon all night. So um, they might be one of the better sh uh, meteor showers to, to observe, um, and might actually be a good opportunity from, from the briars because at least we get a reasonable view of that. Okay, the sources, as always, were um, Stellarium, the NASA Ice on the Solar System website, and the Astronomy 2020, uh, 2024 um, handbook. Now, any questions? Um, which direction? Actually, I can just show you again on this one, I think. Um, let me see. Um, around here. So that's the Southern Cross, and that's the two pointers, and it, it appears to come from around around that area. That's yeah. So between the pointers and crux, or kind of that general general area. So that should be easy to find, and um, and and actually in a quite good position to, to view from up here, probably. Near the near one of the dark nebulas that you should probably take a photo of. <laughs> That's right. Actually, yeah, you've got the entire uh, emu in the sky up here, right? So if you get a f nice photo of that one, that might be a really good option for the MOFO challenge as well. Yeah, is the, head of the, yeah the cold sack is the head um, near the Southern Cross, right? And yeah, and then the. So it's the year of the dragon. Okay. <laughs> The Lunar New Year. Or, uh, yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Just as a reminder, we've got our first cosmology meeting Saturday week. Got a, quite a lot of people coming, a lot of people signed up. Um, so if anyone here would like to come, 2 p.m. we have a start and there's a lot of new people coming so we have to be take it you know, pretty slowly as we go through it all each meeting. Um, just as a quick um, ad for, for our team, uh, we've got a website going now. It's taken a long time to get a website up and running. There's a lot involved. Um, it has a huge amount of information and all the Cosmic Corner issues which are now 149 are all loaded on and all the new issues coming. These guys, the science issues that we're putting out, which are not cosmology, they're actually science issues. So they're also going to be they're going to be loaded on our website. So we'll be publishing, Brian and I will be publishing them each week. Um, you can either answer through the website or you can just send an email back to Brian and I, whichever whichever you wish. So that's what's new. So Let's think about the theory of everything. I know Peter was scratching his head about what is this all about. It is a science holy grail, I've got to say. Um, anyone that comes up with the theory of everything or an equation itself is probably worth a Nobel Prize. Um, if we go back to 1920 when Niels Bohr, Max Planck, um, Werner Heinsberg, all the greats of quantum mechanics came alive and started, and Niels Bohr started to argue with Einstein um, about quantum me mechanics and the validity of quantum mechanics. The idea of coming up with a theory of all space and time, including quantum, at the quantum world, would put everything together in one equation. 
okay? And that's what everyone's been chasing ever since. There's a lot of other things around in, in cosmology and astrophysics that everyone is chasing, but the theory of, any, any, of everything would be something that would be a terrific thing to find. So does anyone know actually what is the theory of everything in this room? Anyone have an idea? No? A lot of people nodding their heads and all that. You're looking through your telescopes. You're looking at the theory of everything. It's basically the culmination of taking general relativity, which was designed by Einstein in 1915, one of his great um, achievements in life. And also that's the, that's the physical world of physics. It, it, the seat you're sitting on there is the physical world, the air we're breathing, the food we eat. When we look through our telescopes, we see everything which is part of general relativity. Okay, and that's matching, bringing that together and unifying it with the quantum world of physics. So we're talking about 10 to the minus 48. We're talking about particles that are very, very small. So they're smaller than atoms in this stage. So that's what the, so if you can bring the two of them together, you are very, very close on getting the theory of, er, of everything itself. The closest attempt was um, the um, publication about in 1965 by a group of um, a various group of scientists um, was the standard model of physics. That's the closest attempt. Yes? Are you really talking about unifying the theory of the very large? And the very small. The very small. I was getting to that. Mechanics and gravity. Uh, more than gravity itself. Yeah. More than gravity. Yeah. All the four forces, all the 26 constants of the universe, everything like that has to come together into one equation. Okay, so but you're pretty well right there. Um, which of the theories we talked about exactly what you're saying, unifying those two theories, and are we aiming at a single singular equation? The the answer is yes. The physicists, the, the particle physicists, and theoretical physicists that are working on this, they want one equation that describes everything that we do, the whole universe combined. And what what will, will this happen in the next hundred years? Let, let's see. Let's see. So basically, you're right. We're bringing general relativity together on the large scale structures of the universe. And they were trying to fit quantum theory, the theory of atoms, right down to subatomic particles, down to the microscopic area, and bringing these two, these two areas of science together. The unification of these theories will explain both the very big and the very, very small. So that's the theory of everything. That's what we're trying to aim at. And this guy up here. Fritz, uh, Fritsch, is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah. Fritsch, 1970. So he started introducing you know, some of his lectures. He did it in Italy. And of course, John Ellis over here, looking a bit crazy on the, on the, on the board there, he introduced it as an acronym. And from that part, many, many scientists started to look at this whole, whole area of science. Of course, when Einstein published general relativity in 1917, he published some more papers. After that, he quietened down and he spent the probably good part of 30 years of his life trying to do this, and he couldn't do it, but he got close. So when we look at the names, Einstein had a go, tried for 30 years, but he was unsuccessful. He died unsuccessful. Uh, Kulsa and Klein, the German and Swedish scientists, they tried to do it through electromagnetic fields, and they partly got there. A collaborative group that we talked about the standard model of physics in 1967 uh, got a lot, lot closer. And then Niels Bohr, Werner Heinsberg, and Max Planck, of course, they got close themselves, but they were leaning towards the quantum side of things, not the classic physical world that we talk about a lot now. So when we're trying to bring everything together, what do we need to bring? What, what's in the cake? Okay, Einstein space time. Of course, we, we know that uh, he debunked uh, Newton when it came to gravity. And of course, we found out now that, um, well, back then, of course, that uh, um, space itself and gravity actually changes and, and uh, changes in a way that it causes the deformation of space time when to, to uh, say two planets or two two uh, stars get together or come close to each other, you're sitting there in your chairs and you are creating a gravity itself. We all create gravity. Okay, Niels Bohr, um, he's the guy that argued with Einstein a great deal. 
but the, this model here had to be had to be brought in, and they got halfway. They they did well in this area. Hubble himself, in 1930, published his papers on redshift and blue shift, meaning the fact that the he found out two things. Firstly, there are other galaxies in the universe, and he was talking he was talking about Andromeda at this stage. Up till then, we thought there was only one galaxy. We thought we lived in only one galaxy from the time uh, of about the 1600s. Okay, um, but his his discovery that we ha uh, have many more galaxies than just the one we live in was a profound discovery, and also he he uh, supported the whole idea of uh, the Hubble constant or the expansion of the universe itself. And then we, ne we need to know a great deal more about dark energy and dark matter. So if we, if we understand this whole group here, we come up with close to the theory of everything. We haven't got an equation yet, okay? So if we look at some of these great theories like A equals MC squared, can anyone here describe what that means? We talk about it a lot. Energy equals mass, or mass can be, it, it's interchangeable, and it's got to be reflected at the speed of light, c, and then squared, okay? So what Einstein's saying is that there is equal amounts of energy in mass, and if you revert it around the other way, the same with energy, when you convert it back into mass. So it's a, quite a profound equation. The same with Newton's law, uh, Fe, FMA. So somewhere in all these equations, they have to come up with something that, it, that brings together or unifies these two main theories. So we look at the pie. What do we know so far? Standard model of physics is unfinished. Does anyone know why it's under? Does anyone know what the standard model of physics is? That's probably yes. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, it's a basic Yep. We know of. Yep. And, yep. Um, it's it's unfinished in many ways because it doesn't predict the masses of anything. It does put the, yeah, it does. Well, it, it, every particle has a mass. Every, it has a mass, but it's, but it's the, published the, with a mass. It's, 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 yeah. Experimentally defined. Yeah. Right? yeah. What it lays out is the fermions. Yep. Which are your quarks? Six six normal quarks, and then six. And I put this out on the. Uh, publication today with everyone receiving all their quarks um, and then you've got your six end quarks okay and when they come together they annihilate each other so they're the fermions and then down the bottom you've got your electrons which is leptons so you've got your main electron and then you have your muon and then your tau and that's that is uh, that, that is uh, respectfully affected by the electromagnetic force and then you go to the other side the bosons which produce uh, the actual, um, the, well, if I could show you the picture in a minute, it's probably a bit, bit easier. So, um, gravity is what's missing in the standard model of physics. Once gravity is understood, which we don't understand too much about it as, at the moment, we understand that gravitons, somewhere in the, the way it's a carrier for gravity, but we don't know what causes gravity. We don't know whether gravity actually interacts with dark energy. But we assume, probably, that there is some interaction between the two of them. But this guy here is a big fan of mine. Um, I don't know whether you read, if you listen to the Freeman lectures at all from 1965, the most famous lectures of physicists in the world. He's at MIT in America. Um, he he came up with the idea of the graviton, but he said it's a theoretical thing about gravity. So the standard model of physics, and I think I've got it here, that's the standard model of physics, is missing here gravity. And until we build gravity in there, we don't actually have the interactions between all these small particles. So here's your quarks, they all have a mass, they have a spin, so if, you, if you're looking at uh, quarks, they have a jiggle or they move, they up, down, down, down quarks. The main quarks these days is the up and down. And if you add those two together and you add this guy down here, the lepton, the electron, they're the three particles that make up everything in this room. Everything in the universe is made of those three particles. This guy, up quark, down quark and electron. 
we hardly see the yawn and tower these days. And then you've got the neutrinos. Everyone know what a neutrino is? It's a massless particle that comes from the sun or stars and can pass through 20 miles of lead in, in less than a second. The most incredible things. So in the end, unless we can come up with gravity to fill in here and then learn about how does it interact with the Higgs particle, the glue on itself with the, with the, um, the quarks, and then the leptons down here, we don't actually have a theory of anything at this stage. So, what's the future for this whole thing? Well, the uh, Large Hadron Collider in, in CERN in, in Switzerland um, has just had a refurbishing of its power and now it's been boosted up to 13.6 televolts. So that means 6 plus televolts are going 27 kilometers one way another six are going the other way. And when they get to just near the speed of light, they can't get it to the speed of light because at the speed of light, time stops. Everything stops, okay? So they get it just there and then they're being either the smashed protons, neutrons, whatever together, then they come up with all these exotic particles like the quarks and all those things. There is a possibility that CERN or the Large Hadron Collider could do this with the new power it's just inherited. Okay, I was hoping to book to go there last year, and of course they're closed. They were closed the day so I was going. It's just one of my knockout things I want to do before I die to, to go there. But it's it's the most incredible machine the world's ever made. Um, so um, the other thing is that conscious mind, as Dr. Chalmers says that. <coughs> Until we understand the conscious mind ourselves, we cannot understand the theory of it, everything. Now, I'm, try, I'm trying to get my head around that statement. I don't know if anyone here in this room can explain this, but um, I, I sort of get there, but it's not that possible to do. And our friend um, Sir Hawking said that there's no chance this will ever happen, not in our next hundred years. So where are we with all this? Will there ever be a theory of anything? So what the big fellas say out there is with our consciousness, we're really, there's not much of a chance to actually work this out. Without knowing gravity, of course, we know that that one, unless we know gravity and, it, and we can fit it into the standard model of physics, we don't have much of a hope. Uh, without replicating the first second of the Big Bang, and we are getting there with CERN at this stage about that, um, we're probably shooting in the dark. It does, Humanity have a capability to devise such a theory today. We're thinking the way human minds are that we're probably about another hundred years off. But AI might step us over, over the, over the edge on being able to do this. Um, should we embrace a supernatural deity? Uh, let's say, let's face it. Should we embrace God um, uh, in this whole quest? And this is what's discussed a lot in uh, cosmology. Um, uh, meetings is uh, will a supernatural deity give us the answers to this? That's another question. Uh, how hard is the unified theory to solve realistically? Extremely hard and it will cost billions and billions of dollars to do it. And the other question is should we really bother? What's the big deal about this? Do we really want to know the theory of everything? I'm doesn't bother me. I still go to sleep and not, not knowing it. But some of the people have a quest to find it. So if humanity can't solve its problems first, what do we do to understand the theory of everything? That's what a lot of the, what do you say, the philosophers say of themselves. And perhaps there is no theory of anything. That's something we should embrace too. Maybe there isn't a theory of everything. Maybe we're chasing a dream that's really not there. See what I mean? So our friend Stephen Walker, a lot of time for Stephen. I think he was a terrific uh, scientist. Um, he, he said a breed of superhumans, essentially a breed of superhumans, will take over having used uh, generic energy to surpass the fellow, our fellow beings with fellow beings. This is AI coming. And I heard today the government is doing a review uh, and hopefully passing legislation by the end of this year all about the use and the, how do you say, the ethics of AI. But I don't think that's going to change anything, really. It's not going to change anything. Um, 
to construct chapels on, yeah. on the development of AI, because if we don't try to do it, for example, Example, uh, they did say in this quote that the, they would not shackle what you were talking about, the, the, um, so the development of AI from a scientific point of view, but AI crosses into humanity and consciousness and all these other things. You know, um, I, I put on all our presentations, we don't use AI. My son, in, uh, who's an examiner in Sweden, he's a PhD in Sweden, um, most of his students are now doing their final master's theories and doing it through AI, and they're not accepting it now. They're saying, no, go and write it yourself. So it, it really is pushing the boundaries in every possible area of life. So I think, yes, there should be some legislation, but you're right, I don't think people are going to respect that too much. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, some books that you want, I would suggest to read about this. Um, if anyone hasn't read this book, it's, prob it's sold probably 40 million copies now, probably, maybe more. Um, without doubt, it's made him a very, very wealthy man in a box underground, but uh, that's the way it goes. His daughter's probably making all the money these days. Um, the Theory of Everything by Stephen Hawking, the biggest ideas in the universe. I like this book, I've read it three times. And Something Deeply Hidden by Sam Carroll, e e exceptional book to read. They all touch on these subjects we're talking about today. And the best book I've ever read that really gets into the subjects a lot is by Lawrence Krauss. Okay, Does anyone know Lawrence Krauss? Have you read his books? And a person in our club gave me this book. And I'm, I haven't been a big reader of Max Tech Mark, but I do say this is a very good book to read too. So, my hunch is that I don't think statistically theoretical physicists, because this is in the realm of theoretical physics, you have to have someone in their early 20s, remember Einstein was 24, when he, when he was 22 when he brought out uh, special relativity, and 24 when he brought out general relativity. Um, he didn't work, he wasn't working in a university, so he was working in a patent office, so he had plenty of time to laterally think. Uh, all that sort of stuff. So we need someone like Einstein that is not shackled by a university, um, um, how, how do you say, the, the, the workings of universities and the, and the shackling of free thinking. Um, when, I, when I think now Warner Hernsberg that wrote The Uncertainty Principle back in 1921, he had to get away from his university in, in, uh, in Germany to actually think about what quantum particles and why don't they behave the way we want them to when in fact they don't. And he had to figure it out. And he, he went to an island for three months and just sat there thinking about it and he came up with it, one of the most profound theories ever. Okay, so we need someone that has a brain like Einstein that can think laterally about gravity and what's going on with gravity. So I think that's pretty well it. Um, um, next time I come, we're going to talk about the question, did the Big Bang at the first one billionth, 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 billionth of a second, did it exceed the speed of light? Okay, think about it, because we know speed of light is infinite, um, and it cannot exceed 186,000 miles per second, but the, there's a lot of work being done now to say that maybe in that first billionth of a second, what they call a quattosecond, I think it's called, the smallest of time or plane sector, second, um, did the speed of light exceed the speed of light? And there's a lot of people say yes, a lot of people say no at the moment. So there, that's next time we see. Any questions about the theory of any, any, Anyone going to go home and do it? Come up with the idea? I think, uh, anyone think that we will do this in the next hundred years. Why is it necessary? That's what I ask. That, that, that's exactly why, right. Why can't we have a set of equations that handle the quantum of well, equations that handle yeah, the yeah. macro We've got equations for electrodynamics, electrochromodynamics. We've got equations for um, uh, when we look at the four forces, they're all the equations. There is a fifth force being talked about, which is the muon. But that hasn't been, um, we say, ratified at this stage. 
we look at the 26 constants, we look at all the laws of physics, uh, that when you're looking through your telescopes, all these things come together. How you put that together when you merge it and unify it with the small guys below the atom size is something that is a big, big challenge and no one can come find this out. And this is why Einstein argued and argued and argued at the Danish meetings and all that about that this is wrong, what they're believing, but he, in the end he had to apologise, he was wrong. Not the greatest of thinkers are always right. Any further questions? Yeah. That's true. That's true. So, continue, continue, there's a chance to get the sun to the game changing new technology. That's right. And like the ability to travel to anywhere in the universe in a split second. Or yeah. Yeah, we've got a long way to go, and I think the, the greatest years of all this was between the beginning of 1900s all the way through to around about the death of Freeman and the death of Einstein. Well, thank you. So, um, what, uh, what we'll do now is, because this will go for about uh, 50 minutes or so, followed by the question uh, time afterwards, uh, this is why have we not found any aliens yet, and indeed if we had the uh, ability to travel uh, instantly across the universe, you'd have to ask, well, uh, m maybe that's evidence that um, they, they aren't even out there, if, uh, if that was uh, even a possibility. So uh, this particular talk was uh, given at the Royal Institution in London back in 2019, and uh, covers uh, all about um, attempting to... Um, uh, detect the presence of uh, aliens via various means. Uh, Keith Cooper here is um, a freelance science journalist, so he writes for magazines such as New Scientist and he's editor of Astronomy Now and uh, Astrobiology uh, magazines and uh, covers it uh, quite well. Uh, if at any time you wish to get up and help yourself to a cup of coffee and that, just quietly uh, go out and come back in. Uh, as I say, this will go for an hour, followed by about half an hour afterwards of uh, the questions. Well, thank you everybody for coming to listen to me talk. Um, if I seem a little bit nervous, uh, this is the hallowed grounds where uh, all the famous Christmas lectures have been held, including, as Martin mentioned, my idol, Carl Sagan. Um, Carl Sagan was one of the, the leading lights in, in SETI. And it's a real privilege for me to be here, especially as it's... Some, uh, something very dear to me, a book I've been working on for quite some time, and a subject that I just find to be completely wondrous and amazing, which is SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So what is SETI? Um, it's not flying saucers or UFOs or abductions or anything like that. It's a scientific search for intelligent life out there, somewhere among the stars. We don't know if it's there, but the only way we're going to know really is to look and see if we can see any evidence of their presence there. Um, and you'll all, many of you will have seen the film Contact, uh, starring Jodie Foster, based on the, the book of the same name by Carl Sagan. Um, and that's all about receiving uh, a radio signal from, from outer space, from an advanced civilization. Um, and, and Jodie Foster gets to go and meet them briefly. Um, and you can see there, she's, she's listening um, to signals from outer space on her headphones with the radio telescope in the background. And I think in the film, she's kind of sat on a car bonnet in the desert uh, by the radio telescope, just chilling out, listening to these signals from outer space. It's not quite as glamorous as, as that, uh, unfortunately. Um, computers do most of the, the, the analyzing of the signals. Um, but why radio? You know, we're talking about an advanced civilization, maybe millions, billions of years older than us. Why would they use something as low-tech as radio? Surely they'd use some kind of hyper-dimensional means of communication. Well, maybe they do, but we can't really detect that because we don't know what that is. So, first of all, we're a little bit limited to detecting 
things that we know about. Um, the second reason why we use radio is um, in 1959, uh, two astronomers, Philip Morrison, who I believe has given Christmas lectures here, and Giuseppe Cocconi, they wrote a very famous paper in the scientific journal Nature. Um, and they were investigating what the best means of, of transmitting a message to uh, nearby stars would be. And so they looked at the electromagnetic spectrum of light and things like X-rays and gamma rays. Um, and they decided that radio would be the best for several reasons. Now, you have to understand, back in 1959, radio was uh, a maturing technology. It developed a lot in the Second World War. Um, everybody had wirelesses in their houses and listening to BBC One and things like that. Um, and a new frontier was opening up in astronomy, of radio astronomy. Um, and radio is really good because as you can see, this is a snapshot of, of the Milky Way, part of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, you can see loads and loads of stars, there's some nebulae in there. But you see this big black band running through the middle. And that's all dust. It's all interstellar dust. Space isn't a vacuum. It's filled with all kinds of stuff. And you can see that the dust there is it's black. It's blocking out the light from the stars behind. So if you tried to send an optical signal of some kind, it wouldn't get very far before it's absorbed by dust. But radio waves pass straight through the dust like it wasn't there. So you can detect signals from much further away, and to give you an idea of how far away we can detect radio signals, many of you will be familiar with this image. It was released earlier this year. This is the first ever image of a black hole. It was taken with the Event Horizon Telescope, which isn't just one telescope, it's a network of large radio telescopes all around the world working together. And this shows the, uh, the hot disk of gas around the, the, the supermassive black hole in the galaxy Messier 87, which is 54 million light years away. And those radio waves, granted, it did take a lot of large telescopes to detect them, but those radio waves have traveled unhindered throughout space, 54 million light years, to, to reach us. Um, so, after Kokoni and Morrison published their paper, um, this chap here, Frank Drake, he also came up independently with the same conclusion, that radio would be a really good way of communicating between the stars. And in 1960, in April 1960, he performed the first ever radio SETI search, which was called Project Ozma. It was named after the princess from the Wizard of Oz stories. And he targeted two nearby stars, uh, Epsilon Eridani, which is 10.5 light years away, and Tau Ceti, which is, I think is about 12 light years away, so fairly close. And on the very first day, he found a signal. He probably sat back in his chair and thought, Craggy, this is easy. <laughs> Turned out not to be aliens. It was actually a U-2 spy plane flying overhead. It was top secret. Nobody knew about it at the time. I think this was a month before Gary Powers was shot down. Um, and you can see here, um, he's writing on, on his whiteboard uh, an equation. And this is the famous Drake equation, what uh, he's, he's most famous for. It, it, it's, don't take it literally. It is... Um, a way of, of, well, basically, they were having a, a, the first ever SETI conference at, at the Green Bank Radio Observatory, where Frank Drake worked uh, in 1961, and Drake was put in charge of organizing the agenda, and he thought, Craig, what on earth am I going to talk about? I don't know anything about aliens. Nobody does. Um, so he came up with this equation as a way of just stimulating discussion about how many extraterrestrial civilizations may be out there, and what factors may be involved in the likelihood of them existing. And it's really fun to plug numbers in and, and see what kind of results we get. So I've done that on the next slide. So the first factor is the rate of star formation in our galaxy, which is about one solar mass per year. All that gas in, in the galaxy is converted into, a, on average, one star per year. The fraction of stars with planets, well, NASA's Kepler Space Telescope, which you may have heard of, um, it launched in 2009 and retired in 2018. It was a, uh, a space mission designed to detect exoplanets, which are planets orbiting other stars. And based on the, on the statistics of the planets it found, it, scientists concluded that pretty much every star has planets, and probably more than one. There's probably more planets in the galaxy than there are stars, which is quite amazing considering that in the early 90s, we didn't even know if there were any other planets in the, you know, beyond the solar system. So the next factor is the number of habitable planets per star. Well, we can have maybe a rough guess of that, because 
we know of a region around the stars called the habitable zone. This is the distance from a star where temperatures should be just about right for liquid water to exist on the surface, providing there's an Earth-like atmosphere. So there's lots of if, buts, and maybes there. Um, it's not necessarily mean that planets within the habitable zone are habitable. Um, so maybe we should look at our own solar system. Well, we know Earth is habitable because we're here. But are there any other worlds in the solar system that could potentially be habitable? And I think there is. There's Mars. We, we know we're looking for life on Mars, microbial life, not intelligent life. But, you know, there could still be life there. Then there's Jupiter's moon Europa, which is an icy moon. It's covered by a thick crust of ice. But below that ice is a global ocean. And it's possible that conditions there could be right um, to support life. And similarly, Saturn's moon Enceladus also has a global ocean underneath the ice and could support life. So I'm going to be really optimistic, and I'm going to say, based on our solar system, that four moons or worlds around a star can have life. It doesn't mean they necessarily have life, and that's the next factor, the fraction of those planets that develop life. Well, in our solar system, as far as we know, only Earth has developed life. And similarly, only Earth has developed intelligent life, and only Earth has life that is transmitting messages, radio leakage, into space. The final factor is the most interesting, I think. The lifetime of a civilization that, that sends signals into space. Um, so this isn't necessarily the lifetime of a civilization from you know, its origins all the way through to its extinction. It's just really talking about the amount of time that it spends transmitting into space. Although you would expect a technological civilization um, to be sending signals for most of its existence, whether deliberate or just accidental leakage. Um, we've been sending signals into space for about 100 years since we start, started broadcasting radio. Hopefully, we're going to be broadcasting signals for a lot longer than 100 years, otherwise it means we've gone extinct. Um, other civilizations, it could be 10,000 years, a million years, even a billion years, we don't know. And as you can see on the next slide, I multiply all those numbers and I estimate there are 100 civilizations in our galaxy right now. And it's it's just a guess. It, nobody really knows. But it, it, as you can see, it gives you a way of considering um, the factors that are involved. Uh, and you can also see there that the larger L is, the larger the lifetime is, the more civilizations there are. And that's because the longer lived a civilization is, the more chance there is that it's going to overlap in time with other civilizations. Um, if, you know, if a civilization exists and dies out, and then another civilization arises, they're not going to detect the one that's died out. So they need to overlap to be able to detect. Although, of course, uh, distances in space um, mean that it could take many years for a radio signal to reach us. We may detect a radio signal from a civilization that has already gone extinct. So, back to radio, and this is a radio map of, of our galaxy, uh, and this has been imaged at the 21 centimeter neutral hydrogen line. So, neutral hyd hydrogen atoms in our galaxy emit radio waves when, when excited uh, at the wavelength of 21 centimeters. And this is mostly the wavelength that uh, astronomers observe the, the universe at because they want to study the hydrogen. It's the most common gas in the universe, the most common atom. And maybe aliens will know that we're already going to be looking at the radio universe at that wavelength. So they'll send their signals at that wavelength because we're already going to be looking, so we'll see them. Um, and back in 1960, when Frank Drake uh, performed Project Osma, we could only look at one wavelength channel at a time. We didn't have the equipment, the technology, to look at many more channels all at once. Today, things are different. We can look at billions of narrowband radio channels all at once, so we can scan the radio spectrum. Um, so whatever wavelength they would be uh, transmitting at, we should be able to detect it. And you have to understand that SETI, uh, it's been looked down on by, in the, by the scientific community, um, probably because there's a little bit of a snigger factor there. People do think of aliens, flying saucers, little green men. And for much of its history, it hasn't really been funded very well. Um, it's, scrimped and, and saved. And in, in the early 90s, it looked like NASA were going to um, have a massive SETI project where they were going to put millions and millions of dollars into it. But at the last moment, this got cut off at the knees by the US Congress that cancelled NASA's funding for SETI. So ever since then, it's been relying on donations. And that means we haven't been able to do many SETI searches. And those that we have done just look at a few stars. Now, 
you might say, well, SETI's been going on for 60 years. Why haven't we discovered anything yet? It's because we've only sampled a small portion of the galaxy. Let me make an analogy. If you went to the seaside with a beaker of glass and scooped up some water, would you expect to find fish in it? Probably not. That doesn't mean there's not fish in the ocean. It just means we haven't sampled enough of the ocean to find those fish. And it's the same with SETI. We haven't sampled enough of the universe yet to find if there are any aliens out there. But in 2016, this chap here on the left, Yuri Milner, he's a billionaire philanthropist, uh, he launched the Breakthrough Listen project. Uh, it's a 10-year project, at least, um, where he's putting in $100 million over the course of those 10 years. And what's that going to do to SETI? It's going to revitalize it. It is revitalizing it right now. Before this, we'd looked at maybe 1,000 stars in detail closely, listening for signals from, from aliens. And when I say listening closely, I'm talking about we listen for maybe half an hour with a radio telescope before moving on to the next one. Well, maybe the aliens were on a tea break or something and we didn't pick up their signal. Who knows? It's not enough time to be sure whether there's anybody out there or not. Breakthrough Listen is going to look at a million stars in close detail. Still only going to be looking for a half an hour or an hour at each star, but still, it's a huge uh, growth in coverage. It's going to be performing surveys of the night sky, sweeping across the sky, listening for large beacons. It's going to be scrutinizing the galactic center, where we can see most of the stars in our galaxy. And it's even going to be looking to distant galaxies in case there's a powerful beacon being beamed our way. Who knows? We won't know unless we look. So Breakthrough Listen is really changing things. And that produces a lot of data. You saw Jodie Foster with her headphones listening to, to signals from space. Well, she can't do that with all this data. There's far too much of it. And to show how far SETI has come since the early days, now they use machine learning algorithms to search for patterns amidst the radio static. There's a kind of an artistic representation of, a, I guess, a robotic Jodie Foster with her, with her headphones and the radio telescope in the background. Now, this is our galaxy. Um, you can see the sun. We're 26,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. Our galaxy contains 200 billion stars, give or take. That's a huge number of stars to search through. So the odds are still against Breakthrough Listen detecting anything. Let's say we did the Drake equation and came up with a value of 10,000 civilizations in our galaxy. We'd still have to search 20 million stars before we found one of those civilizations, on average. Breakthrough Listen is only going to listen carefully to a million stars, so it's still not enough. We have to be really patient doing SETI. We could find a signal tomorrow, or it may take 10 years, it may take 100 years. Maybe we'll never find a signal, but we won't know until we look. Are there any ways that we can improve our chances? Well, we don't have to stick to radio. I know what I said at the beginning about radio being really good, because it can pass through all the interstellar dust. But you know, there are other means. What if aliens are sending messages, not by radio, but by lasers? In 1960, when Drake did his Project Ozma, the laser was just being invented. When it was invented, scientists at the time were... They didn't, they didn't see what good the laser would do. They thought it was a solution without a problem. They said, what on earth could you do with the laser? Which sounds faintly ridiculous now, because we use lasers everywhere in everyday life. And this, isn't a, this is not a laser being sent into space with a message. This is actually a, an artificial... This, this, is the, the, this is the very large telescope in Chile. And basically, they fire lasers at the sky to create an artificial star. And it allows the telescope to lock onto that artificial star and compensate for the, the blurring effects of the atmosphere. You know how you see stars twinkle. Um, but it looks good, so I thought I'd put it in. <laughs> um, now, this is a serious laser. This is the laser at the National Ignition Facility at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories in California. It, has, it reaches a, a petawatt, which is uh, a thousand trillion watts. So, you know, how many light bulbs could you light up with, with that? Um, and what do they use such an overpowered laser for? Well, they used it for nuclear fusion experiments. So you can see all the lasers shining down, and you can just about see an arm coming out from the bottom, and at the end of that arm, they have fuel pellets. And the lasers heat the fuel pellets to millions, hundreds of millions of degrees, to the point that the atoms within them fuse and release energy. And it's hoped that by the middle of this century that we'll have nuclear fusion providing electricity to the national grid. We'll see. But these lasers, for perhaps 
a fraction of a second, can shine brighter than the sun, which is remarkable. So you can imagine pointing these lasers outwards into space and sending pulses containing messages. Um, and are we looking for them? Yeah, we're looking for them. Um, and lasers have an advantage over radio. Radio suffers from what's called dispersion. So as I've mentioned, space is not empty. It's full of atoms and molecules and particles. And in particular, when radio waves encounter electron particles, uh, the, the electron particles interact with the radio waves and cause the longer wavelength radio waves to be delayed. So they arrive at their destination behind the shorter wavelength ra radio waves, and then you know, your message gets scrambled upon arrival, um, which isn't great. That does not happen with laser light. It's been calculated that if we shined one of those petawatt lasers into space with a message, by about a distance of 1,000 light years, about 90% of that light would have been absorbed by dust. So it's limited in range. But can we beat that? Well, yes, we can. Because infrared can pass through some of that dust. Astronomers observe the universe in infrared to see inside dusty star and planet forming regions. So Professor Shelley Wright, who you can see in the background here, came up with the idea of, of uh, building a, an instrument designed to look for infrared laser pulses. She's holding her infrared uh, detector there. It's on the Nickel Telescope at Lick Observatory. Again, she hasn't found anything yet, but it's a new way of doing SETI. Uh, we've only just started, and, and, and perhaps uh, she will. Space, actually, if we had a, an infrared satellite in space dedicated to looking for uh, infrared uh, lasers, that would be more beneficial because our atmosphere does absorb uh, some infrared light. Um, this is up on, on, on Lick Observatory, up on the top of a mountain, so it's above much of the atmosphere, but still. Unfortunately, space missions are expensive, so SETI aren't going to get one of them just yet. Um, are there any other ways that we could search for life in the universe? And indeed, there is. This is an artistic representation of an Earth-like planet around another star. Um, and we can't really image these planets. We don't know what they look like yet. The way that we discover them mostly is through something called transits. Uh, and here is a video. So a planet will move in front of its star, and it causes a dip in light. And then when it moves away from the star, the brightness of the star goes back up. And is the, the, the solar system roughly to scale. A Jupiter-like planet would cause a dip in light of about 1%. An Earth-like planet, much smaller, would create a dip in light of about 0.08%. But our photometers that count photons from these stars are able to measure such minute dips in light and detect the, 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 the light curves, as we call them. And here's a real life light curve of, of an exoplanet. Now, what else can transits do? Well, as a planet moves in front of its star, some of the starlight shines through its atmosphere. And the atoms and molecules within that atmosphere will absorb some of that light. And then when we look at the star's spectra, is uh, some examples of, of, of stellar spectra. When the molecules absorb the light, they create dark absorption lines in the spectra at specific wavelengths. So if there's oxygen in the atmosphere, that will cause an absorption line at a certain wavelength. Similarly, carbon dioxide or methane. And we can then look for biosignatures, gases that can be produced by life. And if we find them in certain abundances in a planetary atmosphere, that might be a sign that there's life there. Of course, it wouldn't tell us whether that life is microbial or animal life or intelligent life, but we'd certainly know there was something there. Another way that we could look for alien life, this is just a, an artist's representation of the, of the surface of an exoplanet. I, I believe this is Proxima b, which is the planet orbiting the nearest star to the sun, Proxima Centauri, which is 4.2 light years away. But another way that we can look for, for life is to search for something called techno-signatures. Now, this is, this is the buzzword in SETI at the moment. It was coined by one of SETI's most famous astronomers, Jill Tata. And techno-signatures refer to evidence of extraterrestrial technology. Now, technically, radio signals and laser signals would count as evidence of extraterrestrial technology, but so could an interstellar probe, or maybe if they're mining asteroids that might produce dust, that we could detect, or perhaps they like building things, megastructures, Dyson spheres, 
is an artist's representation of a Dyson sphere. This is a concept that was dreamt up by the famous physicist Freeman Dyson, again in 1960. There was a lot going on at that time. And he reasoned that an advanced civilization would want energy, the same way that our civilization uses energy a lot. Now, the sun radiates out, I think, 400 trillion trillion watts in all directions, and only a small portion of that falls on Earth. So we only get a little bit of the sun's energy, enough for life on this planet. But an advanced civilization may want more. They may be hungry for more, and they may want some more of that solar energy. So they could build a great swarm of solar energy collectors to surround the star. And in the media, this is often depicted as a solid sphere. That would be unstable. Um, gravitational perturbations could pull it apart or send it spiraling into its star inside, destroying it. So more likely, if aliens felt like doing this, they would build a swarm of solar collectors, or, or here we see interlinking arcs, not connected, uh, and that's much more stable. And you might wonder, well, how would we go about building something of so immense size? Well, Dyson just casually said, well, we could just dismantle Jupiter. I have no idea how we would dismantle Jupiter um, to get the raw materials for a Dyson sphere, but we don't have to. We could bootstrap the process. We could start building solar collectors now, just a few of them, and then the energy that those solar collectors collect could help go into building more solar collectors that collect more energy, and so on and so forth, and we could gradually build it up. And I always like to joke that uh, there'd be you know, the way that we you know, leave construction sites half-finished, we'll look around the galaxy and we won't find Dyson spheres, we'll find Dyson, hemis Dyson hemispheres that never got finished being built. Um, now, have we ever discovered a Dyson sphere? No. But a couple of years ago, we thought we may have. So this is a light curve, like the one I showed before on the animation when the planet transited its star. But as you can see, it looks nothing like that nicely symmetrical light curve in the animation. This is, I mean, Goodness knows what's going on here. You know, we've got dips of all kinds of different magnitudes and sizes. There's no obvious periodicity, which we would expect from a planet in orbit. So this was found by citizen scientists on the Planet Hunters website, where, because Kepler produced so much data, astronomers had to enlist citizen scientists to help go through it all. So they started this website, planethunters.com. You can still go on it today. And they put samples of light curves from stars, and you would scroll through it, and if you saw something that looked like a transit of a planet, flag it up, and then a professional astronomer would follow up. Now, citizen scientists started finding really weird transits like this on the star KIC 8462852. For some reason, astronomers have a tendency to give stars and planets telephone numbers for names. <laughs> um, so this came to the attention of uh, an astronomer at Louisiana State University called Tabitha Bayajian. She collected all the, the data together and found that there were swarms of mysterious objects transiting this star. There didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason behind it. At one point, a quarter of the star's light was blocked. Remember what I said about Jupiter blocking 1%. So whatever was blocking the light was huge. Now, Biagian's first theory was maybe it's a swarm of giant comets, each comet the size of a moon. And you can see in this artist's impression how that could create weird dips. The problem was, we have no idea how a swarm of comets the size of moons could form that would be completely beyond what we know. So then it was suggested, well, perhaps it's aliens. Perhaps aliens have been building something in orbit around their star, and that's what we're seeing, this megastructure transiting its star. And for a while, this was actually taken seriously. And it was really cool because you know, the public got enthusiastic about it, but so did the scientific community. You'd expect them to be sniffy about it, but they weren't. It turned out, in the end, that whatever's causing the, the dips is dust, interstellar dust. We don't know if it's an orbit around the star or whether it's just between us and the star. Um, we don't know where the dust has come from. So it's still a puzzle, it's a fascinating mystery, but it isn't aliens, unfortunately. But I think this, um, and plus Breakthrough Listen, has really revitalized SETI uh, for the public and for the scientific community. It's in the news a lot more now, uh, people write books, and, and I think it's good news even though it didn't turn out to be aliens. Does that mean that we haven't detected any evidence whatsoever that there's life out there? I wouldn't say that. In 1977, astronomers in Ohio at the Big Ear Telescope um, were doing a SETI experiment. Now, you can see the, the telescope there at the bottom 
the left, it doesn't look like your typical radio telescope with a dish pointing up at the sky. Um, it's about the size of, it's supposed to be about the size of three football fields, and on the ground is aluminium plating that prevents the ground from absorbing the radio waves. And you can see two walls on either side. The wall on the right could be tilted to look at different heights above the horizon, and uh, radio waves would come down from space, they would reflect off the tilted wall on the right, reflect over to the wall on the left, and then go into the two feed horns, which you can just see in the picture, or you can see better in the picture in the background, uh, and that's where the receivers were. And the telescope was fixed on the ground, so it couldn't go and point at an object. It had to wait for the Earth's rotation to work in its favour and to bring whatever object it wanted to look at overhead and the object would move in the field of view and be detected by the receivers in the first feed horn. It would move a bit further across the sky and be detected in the receivers in the second, second feed horn, and then it move out the field of view. And there were no astronomers actually at the telescope doing this. It was all automated, and every few days, an astronomer or a technician would have to travel up there and bring back all the data. Now, back in 1977, they didn't have huge hard drives. It was all printed out on that horrible perforated printer paper, reams and reams of the stuff. So, just after the 15th of August of that year, astronomer Jerry Amon went up to get the data, and he was perusing it, and he found something really odd, something he'd never seen before. Here's the uh, part of the, the printout with the, with, with the signal. Uh, you can see lots of numbers and letters there. The numbers and letters denote the, uh, the, the strength of signals detected by the telescope uh, above the background level. So a number of one is one time stronger than the background level. Uh, so the one to nine were background strengths one to nine times higher than the background. And then the letters signified strengths ten or above. So you can see there where he circled it. So you have six, six times stronger. Then it got even stronger possibly as it moved more into the field of view of the receivers. E, that's 14 times stronger. U, 30 times stronger than the background. So he circled it because this was the most powerful radio signal he'd ever seen. And he got wow in the margin, and the SETI legend was born, the wow signal. Now, we don't know what caused it. It could have been terrestrial interference. Maybe it was some kind of astrophysical phenomenon, maybe a black hole swallowing a star, and a burst of radio waves in its final death throes. Or maybe it was aliens. We don't know. Eamon, for his part, is convinced it was an extraterrestrial signal. He, he's ruled out terrestrial interference and other things. Um, but we don't know, and until we detect it again, we'll never know. Now, we have gone back and tried to find it again, but as I mentioned, SETI hasn't had much funding, and searches have been scant. Uh, we have tried, looked for an hour or two, but we haven't detected, again, de detected anything. Um, Perhaps it's the signal is cycling around planets and will eventually come back to point at Earth sometime in the future. We just have to be lucky enough to catch it. Or maybe it was just a one-off astrophysical event that we'll just never know what it was. It's so tantalizing and so frustrating at the same time. So that's kind of a quick potted history of, of SETI so far. It's kind of a rags to relative riches story with uh, the funding now from Breakthrough Listen. But in telling that story, what I haven't done is really talk about the assumptions that we make in SETI and how those assumptions affect our search and our likelihood of success. Now, here's a secret. Don't tell anybody. I don't know anything about aliens. Neither do you. You know just as much as I do. And together, we know just as much as the professional astronomers because nobody has ever met an alien. So how do we know what they might do? Well, we can extrapolate from human civilization. What would we do in the future if we had advanced technology? How would we behave? How is society going to change? And in some ways, that's really good because it allows us to look more closely at our own civilization and understand ourselves better. But that also brings a whole set of assumptions about extraterrestrial life. Alien life may not be like us, but we're kind of looking for something similar to us. Uh, we're looking for human civilization, modern-day civilization extrapolated into the future. So what kind of assumptions does that create? Well, we're looking for technological intelligence. Now, we always seem to equate intelligence with technology, as if one automatically leads to the other. 
There's no evidence that that's the case. We, we don't fully understand yet the origin, the evolution of scientific thinking and of, of, of technological thinking. Perhaps most life in the universe is like dolphins. Dolphins are intelligent, but they're never going to build a radio telescope with flippers. And, and, you know, studies have shown that perhaps most planets in habitable zones around stars could be water worlds. Maybe dolphin life is prevalent, and our kind of life isn't. There could be loads of planets out there with, with similar kind of life to dolphins. We would not detect them, because we're looking for civilizations that produce radio telescopes and transmit radio signals. Another assumption that we make is that aliens are going to be able to detect us, that it's going to be easy for them to detect us or to transmit their own signals. After all, they're advanced aliens, millions or billions of years older than us. Surely there's nothing they can do. Or uh, nothing that they can't do, rather. Um, could they really detect us through our radio leakage? Well, this is a representation of our galaxy. Uh, similar to the one I showed earlier. And you can see inset in that box, you can just see an arrow pointing to a little blue kind of dot. That dot is 200 light years in diameter at the scale of the galaxy, and that is the volume of space with which our radio signals have reached so far. It's not a lot, is it, compared to the rest of the galaxy? Um, so if there's, you know, if there's a, an alien over on the other side, they're not going to know we're here. Um, but it's interesting to talk about our radio leakage because you, you've probably heard that aliens will know we're here because they can detect our TV signals. But even if they were, say, 50 light years away, could they really detect our signals? Could they be watching EastEnders? <laughs> well, I'm skeptical about that, and so with Seth Shostak at the, uh, the SETI Institute, he's done some calculations. That This is the Arecibo radio telescope. It's one of the biggest radio telescopes in the world. It used to be the biggest, but now the Chinese have uh, the 500-meter uh, uh, aperture uh, telescope, in, in, uh, much bigger. And, um, but anyway, Shostak calculated that if we put another Arecibo on Alpha Centauri, on a planet around Alpha Centauri, which is just 4.3 light years away, that Arecibo could not detect our radio and television signals. They would be too faint which you kind of expect, because you know, when we broadcast TV and radio, it's intended for a terrestrial audience, not an extraterrestrial audience, so the signals are going to be pretty faint. Well, what about an Arecibo detecting another Arecibo? If aliens had a telescope the same size as Arecibo, could they detect transmissions from our Arecibo? Well, Shostak calculated that up to a maximum distance of 400 light years, they could. Beyond that, even Arecibo's transmissions would be too faint. And we have sent messages, transmissions, using Arecibo. In 1974, Frank Drake, as I mentioned, the father of SETI, he was the director of the Arecibo radio telescope, and it just had a refurbishment. Um, that big bowl that you saw had just been repaneled, and they'd added a transmitter, and Drake wanted to play around with the transmitter. So at the reopening ceremony, he transmitted this message to the star cluster on the left, Messier 13 which is 22,000 light years away. Now, it's a little bit of a fool's errand, because by the time our signal reaches M M13, M13 is going to move. It's orbiting the galaxy, so it's not going to be there. That's beside the point, really. Um, so he created this signal in binary code, intended for aliens to understand. Now, how many people here understand that? <laughs> not, not many. Not many. So at the top, we have those white dots. They're the binary numbers 1 to 10. And they're meant to be used as a key to understand the rest of the message. Uh, underneath there, we have descriptions of uh, the atoms hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, which are the building blocks of nucleotides, which in themselves are building blocks of DNA and RNA. And you can see in the middle there, there's meant to be a representation of a DNA helix. I'm not entirely sure how aliens are meant to figure that one out. Underneath there, we have a stick figure of a human being, probably the most recognizable thing in the picture. We recognize it, are aliens going to recognize that that is a life form, that that is us? And what are they going to think if they think that's us? So, <laughs> um, and there's the population of Earth at the time, which was 4.3 billion. Underneath there, you can see reputation, representation of the solar system. Uh, the third planet out, Earth, is raised above to try and signify that that's where the signal came from. Uh, and you can see there's nine planets there, because at the time, Pluto was considered to be a, a fully-fledged planet. And at the bottom, that is 
meant to be the Arecibo radio telescope. So, so this brings up issues of its own, in, you know, in terms of how will aliens be able to understand our radio signals. But <laughs> Now, there is a reason. There's a squirrel there. So the gist that I'm trying to get to is that it is difficult to transmit signals, and it's difficult to, uh, to receive signals. Um, Shostak calculated that if aliens had a radio telescope, oh, the size of the metropolitan area of Chicago, which is 24,800 kilometers square, then they would be able to detect, detect our radio leakage hundreds of light years away, thousands of light years. The only problem is such a telescope in our economy would cost 53 trillion pounds. Now, obviously, aliens aren't going to have the same economy that we are. They don't have pounds and dollars, and we don't know what resources they would have exactly. But the point is, it's going to require a lot of effort and a lot of resources and a lot of energy to build telescopes to detect radio signals, and more importantly, to beam out messages of their own for us to hear. And they don't just beam them out once. If they want to be heard, they have to beam them out constantly, in all directions, because they don't know where we are. And that requires a lot of power. Now, why should they do that? They've probably got better things to do with their time than devote disproportionate amount of resources to trying to message somebody who might not even be out there. They may never get a reply. They don't know if anybody's out there, just as we don't. So what would prompt somebody to do that? Well, in SETI, SETI scientists think, well, aliens are advanced, not just technologically, but altruistically as well. They're perfect beings. They're going to be kind and welcoming and have all this pure, selfless altruism. So they'll be happy to spend all their money and all their resources to build uh, radio transmitters. Really? I don't think so. In, in nature, there are two kinds of altruism that are dominant. Um, so the first one is something called kin selection, and that is why I have a picture of a squirrel. So I've got two dogs, and every morning I trudge through wet, muddy fields with them, and around this time of year, squirrels are out in force, hunting for nuts and other tidbits to take away to store over winter. And my dogs love to chase squirrels. Love it. And every now and then, you, you, you hear a squirrel, Shout out a warning from a tree or a branch or wherever. Presumably in squirrel language it means, run for your lives, there's a crazy dog on the loose. Now that squirrel doesn't know any better, it just thinks dog could be a predator. So it's crying out this warning to its offspring, to its nieces, nephews. Run, save yourselves. And in doing so, it puts itself at risk. It reveals its location to this supposed predator. Um, why would it do that? It's doing that because it's safeguarding its offspring. It's safeguarding its genetic information so it can still be passed on to future generations. If they all get eaten by the predator because the squirrel didn't cry out a warning, well, that's the end of their lineage. So nature has this inbuilt mechanism to help us protect our genetic information. And we even kind of do it. You know, if we have children, there are things that we do un unconditionally for them that we wouldn't do for other people, because they carry our genetic information and, and, and we want to help them prosper. Another kind of altruism is called reciprocal altruism. Basically, you do something for me and I'll do something for you. And it's how much of the world works, really. Um, and it's, you know, that's fine. But could it work over interstellar distances? Could that kind of altruism prompt a civilization to throw loads of resources into building a transmitter to send messages out with the vague hope that maybe they'll hear back from somebody. Well, possibly, but distances and time spans of space kind of work against it. They don't know we're here, and even if we are here, they may not get a signal back for hundreds or even thousands of years, given the distances between us. So, I don't know, I'm skeptical that that would work. And this all works against SETI and our odds of finding evidence for extraterrestrial intelligence. Because if their signals are too weak, or they deem it not worth the, the, the effort to send out messages, we're not going to find them. So some people have suggested, maybe we should send out our own messages instead. If they're not beaming messages towards us, maybe we should be the ones to say hello, and provoke them to respond. And this has caused great arguments in the SETI community. Because some people think it's dangerous. We don't know what is out there. Maybe what is out there is malevolent. Maybe it can be a war of the world scenario or something like that. I, mean, I think that's a straw man argument because 
the distances involved would mean that it is unlikely they could mount an invasion expedition. Not that interstellar travel is impossible. So here we have uh, an artist's representation. This, th this is Yuri Milner's other uh, project that he's doing, Breakthrough Starshot. He wants to launch a fleet of tiny spacecraft called Starships and beam them, ride them on laser beams that would push them all the way to, all the way to Alpha Centauri. It would reach a fifth of the speed of light and get there within 20 years. Now, there's still technological obstacles to overcome, focusing the lasers, figuring out how these little spacecraft, when they get to their destination, are going to be able to collect information and beam it back to us. But in theory, it could work. And this isn't the first time that we've thought about sending spacecraft to other stars. In the 1970s, the British Interplanetary Society developed the project Daedalus, which was a, a fusion-powered starship. And there are modern-day equivalents, Project Icarus, Project Dragonfly. It's fine building spacecraft on paper. It's a completely different thing to build one in real life, and that's why we haven't built an interstellar spacecraft yet. But in theory, we could. We already have the Voyager spacecraft venturing into interstellar space. There's no reason why aliens couldn't send a probe to us. It's possible. So it's possible that they could send some kind of invasion force, but I wouldn't worry about that. Um, the analogy that or the example that a lot of people bring up is when the Europeans went over to the Americas and the conquistadors went to the Aztecs and all the trouble that followed. A hundred million people died in that European colonization. But it wasn't all through violence. Most of those deaths were caused by diseases being brought over by the Europeans, which the Native Americans had no inbuilt defense against. Now, again, we don't have to worry really about diseases from aliens, because even if they did come here in some kind of biological form, our biology would probably be completely incompatible, so we probably wouldn't have to worry about that. So I think that's a bad example. But I think we do have to be concerned a little bit about provoking contact too early. Flowers, tulips, what on earth, what kind of trouble could they cause? Well, actually, in 16th century Holland, they caused a lot of trouble. So, tulips were imported over to the Low Countries around that time, and the Dutch loved them. They loved tulips, and they started to buy and sell them for ridiculous amounts of money, and this created an economic bubble. The bubble eventually burst, people lost their money, lost their homes. They called it tulip mania. Now, that was just the, the chaos wrought by a simple flower. Now, imagine we make contact with an extraterrestrial civilization, and they give us some of their technology. It could be far more advanced than any technology we have. Maybe we wouldn't even understand how it works, but it could do amazing things. Now, technology that we invent causes us problems. Social media and the internet, it's great. It's for the interconnectivity. We, you know, people from all around the world are able to connect, but social media is changing society you know, right in front of us. And we don't know how that's going to change us, and it's Obviously, there are bad things about it and good things. Unintended consequences of that technology, just a simple technology of, of the internet. Motor cars, they get us from A to B. You know, they're great for the economy, but they produce light, uh, all kinds of air pollution, and we bulldoze the countryside for roads and, and car parks. An unintended consequence of our own technology. Now imagine extraterrestrial technology that we're not ready for. Maybe they give us a replicator, like in Star Trek, that can allow anything to materialize. What would that do to jobs? What would that do to economies? What would that do to our drive to accomplish anything? We could just press a button and have something materialize. On the other hand, poverty would be eradicated. So there's good and bad. As with any contact civilization in human history, there are good and bad things about it. It's very complex. But I don't think we're ready yet for that kind of alien technology. And so the worry is that by beaming our own messages out and potentially provoking another civilization to reply, and remember, by beaming our message, we're giving them our language so they can understand us, so that we could then understand them when they reply back, we may not be ready for that contact. And this is what I call the contact paradox, the name of my book. We spend our time looking for life out there, but when we find it, we're hesitant about making that contact because of the unintended consequences or the misunderstandings misunderstandings that could occur. So is there a way out of this paradox? I think there is. Now, I mentioned that SETI has been looked down on by the scientific community, and I think that's wrong, because I think 
large areas of science are about life. Cosmology, you think, well, what's cosmology got to do with life? Well, the history of the universe here. Why is the universe fine-tuned for life? It seems suspiciously set up to, to, you know, to build stars and planets and to allow, allow life to exist. Why is that? So that's something that particle physics and theoretical physicists are investigating. It boils down to life in the end. We study star and planet forming regions because we want to understand better how the sun formed and how planets like Earth formed and how planets like Earth got the water that we need for life. Astrobiologists want to understand the extremes to which life can survive, where life could live, and what that tells us about how our own life evolved. So large areas of science are about life. So it seems silly to me for scientists to then shun SETI. It's just part of the great story that we're finding. And so I think before we attempt to contact anyone who may be out there, we should do a little reconnaissance first. All you know, scientists should come together, try and figure out as much they, as they can about life, and to look and see if we can find any using uh, spacecraft such as the TESS mission. We'll see if this animation works. So TESS is the successor to Kepler. It's going to be looking for exoplanets around nearby stars. Uh, next month, in December, the European Space Agency are launching the Cheops mission, which is a mission that's going to characterize some of these exoplanets. It's going to find out exactly how big they are, and coupling that with uh, our understanding of their mass, we'll be able to work out their density and figure out whether they're solid planets or gaseous planets and whether life could possibly exist there. Next decade, the European Space Agency are going to launch another exoplanet characterizing mission called Ariel, that's going to study the atmospheres of planets, like I talked about earlier, and look for these biosignatures. We've got other telescopes coming online. There's the Extremely Large Telescope in Chile, the James Webb Space Telescope. In the future, they have plans for missions that are going to directly image exoplanets, potentially Earth-like planets. And we're still going to keep doing SETI, and we're still going to keep doing astrobiology and understanding more about life and where life could live. And I'm willing to bet that by the end of this century, if there is life on a planet, 50 to 100 light years away, we're going to have found it. So once we find it, then we can study it. We can learn more about it. If it's intelligent life, is it warlike? Are they like us? What kind of technology do they have? What are they like? We can eavesdrop on their own leakage and learn more about them. And then once we do know more about them, then we can think about making contact and opening those hailing frequencies. To me, that would be the responsible thing to do. That would be what I would expect an advanced civilization to do with us and to treat us with kid gloves, rather than come blurting in. So, just to end with, I think the take-home message is that when we do SETI, there's a phrase I use in my book, the, the stars are like a mirror. We look to the stars for alien life, but we see our faces reflected back. When we're doing SETI, yes, of course, we're thinking about alien life, but we're also thinking about human life. We're extrapolating from our own experience and putting ourselves in context, learning about ourselves. And in writing the book, you know, I learned so much about human altruism and human intelligence and how Earth formed and created a habitable environment and how we may go extinct. And when we, look at advanced, when we consider advanced alien civilizations, we, you know, as I said, we really they're a proxy for advanced human civilizations. And we have a chance to perhaps one day be one of those advanced civilizations. But we won't be if we blow ourselves up, or we allow the climate emergency to destroy the environment, or a pandemic wipes us out, or a million other threats that we face. So we could start right now addressing these concerns and building a better future. And perhaps one day we will be one of those advanced civilizations and we will be able to reach out into the galaxy and meet other civilizations. But until then, we should learn, we should listen, and just do what we can to build a better future for everyone. So, that's it. That's, thank you for listening. And Before we uh, kick off, 
Uh, actually, uh, a gentleman emailed me beforehand, uh, so I've got his question here. So thank you to David. Um, you don't have to show yourself if you don't want to, um, but thank you for your question. And his question was basically around um, this idea that because of you know, the, the laws of relativity, the speed of light, these sorts of things, the actual chance of us ever meeting a civilization face to face, if we do establish contact, is so unlikely that, that we'd have to send somebody off and maybe put them into suspended animation or use any of these kind of technologies. So I just wondered if you'd talk a little bit more about once we've made contact, how would we ever meet these, these people, these beings, these other civilizations, sure. or, or would that just, because of the distances, is it unimaginable? I mean, I've, I'm a huge science fiction fan, and I fervently wish that something like warp drive could be feasible. Mm -hmm. But it probably isn't. So from that aspect, the, the, the gentleman asking the question is correct. It's, you know, it's going to be very difficult for biological life forms to travel across interstellar distances and, you say, meet each other face to face. Not necessarily impossible for robotic probes. Uh, the two Voyager spacecraft, which were launched in 1977, they've just passed the heliopause. They've left the heliosphere, which is the sun's magnetic area of influence, and they're out in interstellar space. Now, they're going to go offline in a few years, but perhaps uh, an advanced civilization could build probes that could last for centuries or millennia. Maybe, maybe the probes could um, build replicas of themselves and spread out in a colonizing wave. Uh, it's been suggested that you may have heard of something called the technological singularity, which is this idea that in the future we'll be able to merge with computers and basically become machines ourselves. And if that is the case, then maybe we could load ourselves up onto these probes and, and go out into, into space. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, you know, the concerns about being invaded by aliens or whatever probably isn't accurate because of the interstellar distances involved. It just makes travel for biological life, at least, really, really difficult. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, this gentleman uh, at the front was, uh, I think, first with his hand up, and then we'll, then we'll go here, and then we'll pick some other questions. And, and do remember, um, there's no such thing as a stupid question here. The only stupid question is the one that you don't ask. So uh, please carry on. Yeah. Um, isn't the central problem about contact with extraterrestrial intelligence is that we've been capable of sending out radio signals for about 100 years. So the likelihood is, if we come across any civilization that is able to uh, pick them up, or indeed transmit them, they're going to be a lot more advanced than we are, because they're not going to have developed that ability exactly parallel to ours. And looking at our own history, the uh, history of contact between technologically advanced societies and technologically primitive societies has not been a happy one. Um, and a lot of our efforts as humans are, is directed towards advancing ourselves, to developing new medicines, new technologies, and so forth. But if you have a society that we're in contact with that knows all those answers, all our efforts come pointless. I mean, if, you're, if your society is based around chipping out stone arrowheads and going hunting wild pigs or something, mm -hmm. And suddenly you find a society where you can just ask them, they'll give you a, ta a tin of spam or something, mm -hmm. then your whole society collapses because its whole raison d'etre has vanished and we would just become a sort of beggar society. All that effort would be pointless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly possible that, you know, if... I think that was kind of the wish, certainly in the early days of SETI, that we would detect some kind of an Encyclopedia Galactica which would contain you know, all the secrets of the universe and tell us how to cure cancer and diseases and prevent global warming and, and, and things like that. Again, a message like that, I think, would depend on a degree of altruism from the other civilization. Would they want to give us all that information? Um, you know, if, if they give us our advanced technology, how do they know that we're not going to turn around and use it against them or something like that? So that could prevent them. But, but you're right, you know, if they give us all the information, tell us, you know, all the secrets of the universe, what more is there for us to do? Um, and yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a valid concern. I, I don't have any uh, disagreement with that. Um, I, I, think, I think there's going to be a language barrier problem when we meet alien life, um, and a cultural problem because we would share no cultural history, um, whether we could, even if we could decipher their language, whether we would understand their cultural idioms. Um, is a question. 
Um, so I think there's still a lot of ifs and buts and maybes. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I don't think doing SETI to try and get, you know, medical cures and things is is a, a valid reason for doing SETI. Um, but you know, maybe they could. I, d I don't know. Um, but it's, it's certainly a possibility, and it has been raised by by other SETI scientists in the past. Um, but but yeah. But we have to make contact at some point. So at some point we're going to have, you know, if we can have a conversation, there's going to be that transfer of information at some point. But yeah, I think I think there's still. So you're talking about science, and you know, there's still artistic efforts that we do. Uh, maybe aliens would be interested in our art, not our science, uh, and we could use, you know, could trade our art for for their scientific knowledge. Uh, I'm just throwing ideas out here. Nobody really knows, uh, but it is it is kind of fun to to guess and speculate. But yeah, I, I, in principle, I I agree. There's a question here. So, hello. Um, my question is, um, can it be that some alien civilizations have developed their technologies over millions of years to such an extent that they're actually, they've actually shrunk themselves down to microbial size and they're sort of floating around, you know, like um, on Earth, you know, basically mm -hmm. in front, right, right in front of our eyes. And, you know, do, do you think that's possible and have you touched on that on your book, in your book? It's not mentioned in my book, but I have heard it discussed. So I don't think biologically we could shrink ourselves down to, to, to the scale of microbes. There are, you know, the laws of physics will, wouldn't let that happen. But I guess, you know, I, I mentioned the technological singularity and the idea that we could upload our brains into machines. And then obviously we have nanotechnology, which are basically nano-sized machines. So I, I, I guess in principle, um, I'm not saying it's possible, but... I guess there's a degree of feasibility about that idea, yeah. Yes, I think I have a sort of a dim picture of how a radio telescope um, detects incoming radio signals, but how does a radio telescope send outgoing signals, and what's the limit on the power of a signal that can be sent? Well, most radio telescopes can't send signals. Uh, most can only listen. Um, but Arecibo is different in that it has a transmitter, just like a, a transmitter you know, that transmits out our television signals, which is a lot more powerful. Um, and you can also use radar, obviously that's sending out radio waves. Um, so that's, all, it's not, that's really all it is. I, just think of it as a, a trumped up um, a TV aerial, really, just a, a much bigger transmitter. Um, in terms of power, I, I, I'm not sure I couldn't give you a, figure, a specific figure for Arecibo without looking it up. Um, but as I, I, I mentioned, you know, one Arecibo could detect another Arecibo at most at about a distance of 400 light years, and, and Arecibo couldn't detect our television broadcasts from Alpha Centauri, so um, that gives you some indication. Keith, you talk Thanks. quite a bit about uh, Proxima Centauri, uh -huh. which I think is uh, recognised um, as being a potentially uh, habitable planet. I'm very interested to know, what is your view of the TRAPPIST-1 system, where you have like seven Earth planets, at least one of them within the habitable zone? Do you think that could be a possible home for an extraterrestrial civilization? Yeah, so, so for anybody who doesn't know, TRAPPIST-1 um, is a planetary system that was discovered a few years ago, and as a gentleman says, there's seven planets orbiting this star. It's the, pretty much the most planets we found around one star so far, other than the planets around the sun. The problem with TRAPPIST-1 is it's what's called a red dwarf. Uh, these are the, the most common type of stars in the universe, but they're the smallest and the coolest. Now you think they're small and cool, um, they, they can be dangerous stars. Well, actually, they're really magnetically active and they unleash flares of radiation. Uh, and because they're cool, the planets have to be closer into the star to be warm enough to be in the habitable zone. But by being so close, they're in the firing line of all this radiation. So there's a big question mark over whether planets around red dwarfs could be habitable anyway, or whether they've been irradiated and their atmosphere is blown away. Um, and we don't know yet until we have the, you know, the ability to probe those atmospheres, which hopefully soon we will. Uh, when you're looking at um, planetary life, do you take into account the levels of entropy, and is that possible to do? Can you expand on that a little bit? Well, if you've got a, a planet which has very high levels of entropy, uh -huh. it's unlikely that they'd be able to, you know, according to the second law of thermodynamics, be able to have many reactions going on. Whereas if it's low entropy, right. it'd be more likely to contain life, maybe. I don't know. 
I don't know about high entropy. Certainly on Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, there's been some speculation that there could be life there. Now, now Titan is the moon that has the methane lakes, and it's very, very, very cold, about minus 179 degrees at the surface. Uh, and it's been speculated because um, there's this kind of organic soup on Titan, all these hydrocarbons, which are basically essential building blocks for life. And it's been speculated that maybe Titan could have life. But the argument against that is that it's so cold there that those reactions you talked about would progress so slowly that life would be impossible. Um, so I guess there's that. In terms of higher entropy, um, I'm afraid I'm, I'd have to defer to somebody who knows a little bit more about that. I um, thought the talk was great. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, aside from funding, what's the biggest hindrance that SETI faced to finding an extraterrestrial life, do you think? <sighs> I'm going to say impatience. Because it's a big universe out there, and a lot of stars to search through. And you know, you've probably heard people saying, well, we've been doing SETI for 60 years, and we haven't found anything. It's a waste of time. There's nobody out there. Um, and as I explained, you know, we've, we've barely sampled the galaxy, so we can't possibly come to that conclusion. But I think if people do start to get impatience, impatient, then, then, then funding that you, you mentioned could, could start to dry up again if people think it's a waste of time because we've searched for long enough. Um, it's a project that's going to last a long time. Hopefully not. Hopefully we'll find something tomorrow, but the likelihood is it could take a long time. So we, we have to start thinking in the long term. But, you know, I think as a society we need to start thinking more long term anyway to, to deal with the problems that society currently faces. So, so maybe there's a lesson in SETI for us in that regard. Keith, thank you very much. Um, could you comment on Oumuamua, the uh, thing that came through our solar system? Sure. And then can you... Your, talk seems to also touch on the Fermi paradox, which you didn't mention by name, but no. the notion of uh, a very large universe with long expanses of time, and yet we haven't found anything yet. There are a number of great filters that people have proposed as solutions to that. Maybe you could touch on that, too. Okay, sure. So I'll, I'll dig with the first part first, which is Oumuamua. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, in uh, 2017, uh, astronomers discovered uh, this object. They thought it was a comet at first. Then they looked at its trajectory and found... This hasn't come from the solar system. This has come from out there. This has come from interstellar space. It was the first ever interstellar object found passing through our solar system. Um, and, you know, everybody got excited about it. But it was very strange. It had a very strange shape. It was very elongated, um, quite unlike anything um, in our solar system, they thought. That's been revised a little bit, and it's not very elongated. It's just a bit elongated. Um, and we have found a couple of objects in, in the solar system that are oddly shaped. But it was suggested maybe it's an alien spacecraft just flying through it, a bit like the Arthur C. Clarke novel Rendezvous with Rama. And a professor at Harvard, Avi Loeb, suggested it was a, a, a spacecraft, in particular uh, with a solar sail. And the reason he thought this is because it moved, it changed direction. Now, if you're coming through on a, on a hyperbolic orbit, you should stick to that orbit. Um, but it veered off from that just a little bit. Now, comets do that because they have outgassing, and the outgassing pushes them, uh, 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 moves them off that trajectory. But there was no evidence of outgassing from Oumuamua. Now, most cometary scientists figured, well, there must have been. It must have been just at such a low level that we couldn't detect it. But Avi Loeb at Harvard did suggest that maybe it was a spacecraft with a solar sail, and it was a solar sail that was pushing it. Uh, off the hyperbolic trajectory. Um, most, well, I would say every uh, scientist who researches comets would, would disagree with that. Uh, this, it was tumbling, and uh, if it was a solar sail, then it, you know, if it was tumbling, it would be all over the place. Um, they're fairly confident it was a kind of quasi-comet asteroid object. And we found another interstellar object since, Comet Borisov, um, and they're expected to be thousands of these things coming through the solar system at any time. So that's Oumuamua. Um, so you mentioned the Fermi paradox. So uh, again, the Fermi paradox is um, the question, if we expect them to be out there, aliens to be out there, why don't we see any evidence of them? And this was a paradox. I don't like calling it a paradox for reasons I'll get onto in a minute. 
Uh, so in 1951, a physicist called Enrico Fermi, he worked on the Manhattan Project and he worked at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in, in the United States. And over lunch one day, he was looking through a copy of The New Yorker, which is a satirical mag uh, magazine in the United States. And uh, there was a, a cartoon depicting aliens stealing trash cans because there'd been a spate of A-flying saucer sightings in New York and a spate of mysterious trash can disappearances. So the <laughs> cartoonist had the, uh, the aliens abducting the trash cans. So anyway, Fermi is looking at this and he puts it down and thinks, why aren't they here? So he kind of, he disregarded the flying saucer sightings. He said, if there are advanced aliens out there, why don't we see evidence of them? Why haven't they colonized the galaxy and colonized Earth? There's, there's been enough time in the history of the universe for them to do this. And after the fact, this became called the, the Fermi Paradox. And it's been broadened to encompass things like why don't we detect radio signals and, and things like that. I don't think it's a paradox. It's a pa it is a paradox, but it's a paradox of assumptions. We're making assumptions. It's not a paradox of, of information or fact, because for the reasons I mentioned, we haven't searched far and wide enough to, you know, to say that they're, that they're not out there or, or anything like that. Uh, and in terms of interstellar flight, we've covered that, that interstellar flight is feasible. And Fermi didn't think it was, and that was his solution to it, that just interstellar flight wasn't, wasn't possible. Hi, um, thank Hi. you. Uh, something you touched upon is something that absolutely torments my brain. So, um, Basically, we're looking for life in the way that we know it. So we're looking in the habitable zone. Mm. And I understand the practicality of that, because you know, it gives us a place to start from, but it... it it strikes me as a little bit arrogant to think that life will only ever, or, or will, it is the most likely way for it to form. So I'd like to know that, although the practicality is obviously searched that way, is there anyone else looking for ways life could be otherwise, so not in those habitable zones? And if so, where are they starting? What kind of framework would you use to do that? Yeah, sure. So the habitable zone is, I mean, some planetary scientists really hate the notion of the habitable zone. Um, because it's dependent on so many things. You know, it needs to be an Earth-like planet. I mean, Mars and Venus are kind of at the inner and outer edges of the habitable zone, and neither of them are remote. Well, maybe Mars possibly is. So I, I mentioned um, Jupiter's moon Europa, uh, Saturn's moon Enceladus, and, and Titan as well. Um, so these are way outside of the, the normal habitable zone. Um, but they have oceans underneath. They're kept warm by gravitational tidal forces from the giant planets that they orbit. So they are really where astrobiologists are focusing their attention. Um, and yeah, it's, it's you know you, you could have a planet beyond what we consider to be the habitable zone, but the atmosphere could be so thick that it could stay warm enough anyway for life. Could there be life that doesn't need water, that doesn't need warmth? And if so, where would we start to look for that? Or is anyone even thinking about that? Or is it too far beyond what we can think ourselves yeah. to even do that? I think astrobiologists are thinking of that. So they study, you may have heard of extremophiles, which are microbial life that can live in, or thrive even, in extreme conditions that normal life would just die instantly in. So you have you know, extremophiles that can survive in uh, extreme radiation, or an extreme temperature, or that can, you know, can exist in really dry conditions. But even they need some water. As far as we know, all life needs water. Um, now, could there be alien life so alien that it doesn't need water? An astrobiologist would probably say no, certainly for sort of carbon-based life that we understand. Um, but, you know, the very definition of alien is not like us, so... I, I, would, I would say most life probably does need water. Although the, the, li the life, the, well, on Titan, methane takes the place of water. So the lakes are liquid methane and liquid ethane and hydrocarbons. And actually, Chris McKay at NASA Ames, he has developed a model where life could survive on methane without the water. It's fairly speculative. Um, so yeah, so I guess people are kind of thinking of that, yeah. Well, can we, can we just solve this with a show of hands? Who thinks you can have life without water? Anyone? Oh, few. Who thinks, no, you do need to have water to have life? Oh, it's about 50-50. <laughs> oh, well. Um, there's a question just, just behind you, but we'll take the question there first. You've spoken about intelligent life in the universe, but what do you think about the hypothetical issue that by looking for life, we could be interfering with the evolution of less advanced organisms or civilizations? Yeah, sure. So, 
So, you know, Elon Musk talks about colonizing Mars. Now, if we found microbial life on Mars, for instance, I think colonizing Mars would be a really bad idea because I think we should leave that life alone, even if it's microbial. You're talking a bit, a bit about the prime directive from Star Trek, let's not interfere with civilizations. Because the universe is so old, the likelihood is that most civilizations are going to be more advanced than we are. But I guess it's feasible that there could be, you know, uh, planets with, with life maybe, you know, equivalent to our Neanderthals or, or, or you know, hum humanity's ancient ancestors. Um, would it be morally right or ethically right to interfere with that life? I don't think it would be, but it depends what you call interference. If an asteroid is about to hit that planet and wipe all life out, is, you know, could we interfere and, and prevent that if we're an advanced society? I think that would be morally and ethically right. But in terms of messing around with their culture or their society, I mean, I, I've watched too much Star Trek, so I believe in the Prime <laughs> Directive, so I would say no. Thanks for a really good talk and congratulations on the book. Thank you. Um, I, I might have a... I have one theory for the Fermi Paradox, mm -hmm. and I'd like to know what you think of it. Okay. Um, considering that we only can experience 5% of the universe, perhaps the 95% is teeming with life and civilizations and alliances and, and maybe we're the anomaly, like a rogue star or something. Maybe we're just not where we're supposed to be and uh, dark matter is where all the matter actually right, is. Right, yeah. So, so you, with 5%, you're referring to um, the baryonic matter, the matter that's made up of neutrons and protons, the stuff that we can see, all the galaxies and gas and dust in the universe. But there's a huge amount of matter in, matter in the universe missing, um, dark matter. Um, and we, we know it's there because we can see its gravitational effect. The problem is we have no idea what gra dark matter is. We don't know what it's made of or what it can do. We know that it interacts weakly uh, with, with other matter. Um, could dark matter support life? Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's quite speculative, considering we don't know what dark matter is. So I, th there are science fiction stories that, that posit that uh, hypothesis and have dark matter life. Um, I'm going to sit on the fence and say I don't know, because, because we don't know what dark matter is, and until we do, I, I'm not sure there's much we can say about that. But, but you're right, you know, there's huge chunks of, of the universe that we cannot see. We don't, we don't know what it is. You know, we look at galaxies and baryonic matter, the stuff that makes up us, but that's just a small percentage of, of the matter in the universe, so yeah. You said that if there was um, like microbial life on Mars, you would be disinclined to go there and interfere with it. Um, I was wondering, what if we're the microbes? So, yes, so... So are you talking about um, sort of life on Mars and Earth being shared through meteorites? Or? No, no, I, I mean if there are oh, life I see. forms right, out right, there right. and they look down at Earth and think, oh, yeah. they're cute, let's not interfere with them. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Well, you know, that, I guess that is you know, a risk of, of, of contact, um, although if they're that advanced, I'm not sure there'd be anything we'd be able to do anyway. Um, but you have to wonder, you know, if a civilization really is a billion years older than us, a billion years, what would they be like? What could they accomplish? Would they, you know, Arthur C. Clarke said that, that famous quote about advanced technology being like magic. You know, would we think they're gods? Um, again, this is a scenario that has been in Star Trek and science fiction like that before. I mean, let, let's face it, if there were, really was a technologically advanced, and when I talk about an advanced civilization. I'm not talking about them being advanced culturally or socially or anything like that. I'm just talking about their technology. Um, you know, we'd really be dependent on them, on them being nice to us. There'd be nothing we could do, really. Early on, you, meant, you talked about establishing contact, uh, I guess, through uh, sending signals to each other before meeting them. But it seems to be a bit of a... It doesn't really seem to describe the situation if it's, let's say... 100 light years away, are you really like establishing a dialogue if it takes 100 years, or is it just kind sure. of sending them a record of our society slowly? Yeah. No, you're right. And, and, and that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why aliens might not want to send, go to the effort of sending out messages, because they're going to have to wait so long for a reply. From our point of view, I think if we receive a signal from 100 light years away or 1,000 light years away, it kind of doesn't matter if we reply or not, because we would, we would know that we're not alone. That would be the most important information from that signal. Um, 
we are, you know, we're finding planets around stars that are 10 light years away, 20 light years away, and if there was life on there, then it would be feasible to have a protracted conversation. It would take decades, but it, we could, you know, we could do it in our lifetime. Um, certainly for beyond there, then it does become more difficult to have a conversation, as, as you say. Um, so maybe they would just dump all the information they have and send it in, in one burst, um, possibly. And that's the Encyclopedia Galactica that I, I alluded to earlier. But you're right, distance is a, a factor against SETI, yes. Hello, thanks very much. Hi. Uh, I wonder whether you have seen the film called The Arrival? I haven't yet, so don't spoil it for me. <laughs> yeah, okay. I was going to ask whether uh, you think the first real contact might be similar to that uh, describing the movie. Right, but right. So, so, it's so, a question for the next, maybe, like. Yeah, so, so um, what I know of the film is that aliens come to Earth and, and then the, uh, the main character is a linguist who has to go and... Yeah, Speak there's a big communication problem. Yeah, so, so that was really, you know, that's, even though I've not seen it, it is on my watch list, but, um, you know, that, that's really good because, you know, if you watch Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever, every, all the aliens speak English. Or, or we have some magical translator that can translate any language that, even if, you know, we've never encountered it before. In reality, if we did receive a message from aliens, you know, Unless they knew of us beforehand and had detected our radio leakage and, and had understood our language, we wouldn't understand what they're saying. It'd be a completely foreign language. And it would be extremely difficult to decipher without some kind of Rosetta Stone. Um, so, yeah, I think a language barrier would be a really big obstacle to understanding. And, and that's, you know, if we made contact and had some kind of dialogue, that language barrier could meet, lead to misunderstandings, which could lead to detrimental effects in, in, in contact as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's something that people don't really talk about. Um, if you want to learn more about extraterrestrial languages, there is actually a book called Extraterrestrial Languages. It's just come out, um, published by, it's by a writer called Daniel Oberhaus, and he talks about, uh, there's an artificial language called Linkos that was developed by mathematician in 1960, again, that year, everything happened in that year, didn't it? Um, Hans Frodenthal, and um, this is meant to be a language that even aliens could understand, and it starts off with basic principles and, and builds up and builds up. Um, but yeah, without some kind of Rosetta Stone, some kind of, something that we could both come together on and commonly understand, then I think it's going to be difficult. Yeah. Thanks. Um, the ladies kind of stole my question. <laughs> I was going to ask what you thought the most realistic depiction of um, kind of contact that you've seen, in your opinion, and you should definitely see Arrival because it's a great yeah. film. <laughs> um, see, Contact, uh, the movie and the novel by, by Carl Sagan is, I mean, that's based around SETI and about detecting uh, a message. Uh, and they give us technology which allows... Uh, which allows um, uh, Jodie Foster's character to, to go and, and meet them. Um, and they're kindly aliens. Um, but most realistic... I don't know, I mean, there's, there's some pretty wild ideas in, in science fiction literature, um, you know, that's written by authors with good scientific backgrounds. Um, Rendezvous with Rama? Yeah, yeah, so that's uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, about spacecraft from somewhere unknown passing through the solar system. It's not heading here, it's going somewhere else, and we just happen to hop aboard and, and um, you know, discover this amazing kind of spacecraft. And I think in the later books, they, they actually, some of the astronauts actually go with the... the, the Arabian species that communicates in colour. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's an, an interesting point, because we're assuming that aliens are going to speak a language and that they're going to be able to see things. Well, what if they're like bats and they use echolocation? You know, us sending an audio message isn't going to be much good. So again, that's another assumption about how we expect aliens to communicate. Um, and they may not, they may use other means. Hi. Hi. So I wanted to ask basically from everything you've said, it seems that you're more leaning towards the strong anthropic principle, which is that the universe lends itself to the creation of life. Uh -huh. But what if, what if we're operating under the scenario that the, it's, there's a weak anthropic principle, which is that the conditions for life are extremely rare? So, for example, in the case of Earth, mm -hmm. we have an un unusually large moon, which is because another planet smashed into us, uh -huh. it, and it gave us a surplus of iron in our core, which makes our magnetic field unusually strong for even a planet within the habitable zone, which protects our life. 
So what if uh, we're operating under a weak anthropic principle in the universe? Yeah, so, so what you talk about there is, is also like the rare Earth scenario, that we're just kind of lucky that Earth is just right for life, so we're bound, you know, this is the only place that life could evolve, and it did evolve here, and the other planets, they have whatever factors means that life can't evolve there. I don't agree with that principle. I think, you know, that famous quote from Jeff Goldblum, life will find a way. If you look at Earth, we think it's special. You know, you, you raise the example of a moon and that we need a large moon to keep Earth's tilt stable and that without a large moon, Earth would wobble all over the place and that would create climate chaos. But there are ways around that. You know, that they've done computer simulations that show if Earth was spinning retrograde fast, wouldn't need a moon to keep us stable. Um, you know, other things like... You know, the, the other rare Earth ideas, I think, you know, there are ways, you know, like, does a planet need plate tectonics uh, to facilitate the carbon silicate cycle, to, um, mon you know, to act as like a global thermostat to moderate temperatures over uh, large expanses of time? I think, you know, planetary scientists have looked at that and looked at ways around that. So I, I don't believe in the rare Earth scenario. I certainly believe in, in what you mentioned about the strong anthropic principle that the, you know, the universe seems suspiciously fine-tuned for life. Um, and then that leads us into the many worlds sort of multiverse theory, um, which is, I guess is beyond the scope of, of, of this lecture. But um, yeah, I think there's all kinds of possibilities. I, I'd hesitate to narrow things down too much and saying, Life or the universe can only be this way. Um, I don't think we know enough to be able to make that, that determination. I have a, well, first of all, thanks for the, for the talk. It was super interesting. Um, do you think that it might be possible that um, someone is sending signals, but we are just not able to get them? It's just like we send a radio signal to some spiders, they will never get them, right? right so yeah. so like, do you think that's, that's possible? Yeah, I mean, I mean, just looking at the radio, for instance, you know, we might miss their signals. So we're not, we're not uh, searching enough to find maybe all the signals. But moving away from, from radio, there's been some speculation that maybe aliens would use neutrinos as a way of sending messages. I, I don't think neutrinos are a particularly good way to do that because neutrinos hardly ever interact with matter. You could have a, a bar of lead half a light year long and most of the neutrinos would go straight through it. But it has been speculated that maybe aliens would want to use neutrinos for some reason, or gravitational waves, things that we're not, we're not really considering looking for messages in. Um, or maybe they're using some kind of technology that we haven't, we don't know, maybe they're using hyperspace or something like that, and we just wouldn't be able to detect that because we don't know hyperspace exists or, or have technology to detect it. Um, there's even been suggestions that aliens were here long ago, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the previous question about interfering with life, maybe they left some kind of code in our G DNA. Um, there's even been a suggestion that we should look for patterns in the cosmic microwave background. If our universe is some you know, kid's lab experiment, and, you know, then maybe they've left a, a message in the CMB for us to, to, to find. Um, so there's all, you know, all kinds of speculative ideas. We've barely scratched the surface of them. But, so yeah, in principle, I'd, I'd agree that it's, it's, it's feasible. Most biological species don't last more than about two million, three million years at most. So do you think we, shouldn't be, we should be seeding the universe with information about life and how to create life on the off chance that we could, that would be our way of contacting people um, and, and alien species would be by sending them information about how to make a human or how to make whatever, uh, some sort of form of Earth life. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's two things there. Um, yes, you're right that species tend not to last forever. Um, look at the dinosaurs wiped out by an asteroid and a supervolcano, but I'd point out that we're the first biological species that has the ability to prevent an asteroid wiping us out. Um, so, you know, we could use technology to prolong our existence. Yeah, and it's been, it's been speculated that perhaps, you know, one motivation for an alien civilization to send signals is if they're dying and, you know, they want to, um, you know, just tell the universe that they were here. Um, I guess that's one motivation for doing it. It's a slightly depressing motivation. Uh, um, I, I, I guess so. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to focus more on trying to survive 
Um, but, but yeah, absolutely. If we thought we were all doomed tomorrow, then yeah, let's get on those radio transmitters and, you know. Well, on that absolutely cheery and <laughs> delightful note, it's been a, a fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Keith. And uh, we look forward to reading your book. Thank you. And with that, we'll uh, with that we'll uh, close in a moment. Uh, this uh, this will show uh, all the phases and uh, libration movement of the moon for the rest of the year um, for uh, the southern hemisphere, and uh, it's set to uh, um, a bit of music called uh, "Perception" by uh, Ben Tisu. And uh, I'll note a couple of things. So th this has one frame effectively every hour of the year. And you'll notice the horizontal line there has the Earth on the left and the Moon is on the far right near the number 32. That's uh, how far the Moon away is from the Earth in terms of Earth diameters. So as you see, the Moon is uh, roughly between 28 and 32 Earth uh, diameters away. Uh, the circle up in the top left-hand side shows the view of the uh, orbit um, uh, from above, looking down. So the uh, Earth you see is the center of uh, that circle. And uh, the band that goes around in a circular shape is uh, the orbit of the moon and how it actually moves from uh, around that band. So uh, you'll notice the term perigee up at the top uh, right-hand side, which is the closest uh, point to the Earth, and apogee on the other side, which is um, the uh, point uh, furthest away. And you'll see as it's moving around, the uh, moon will move in and out of that uh, band as we go through. So this goes for about two minutes and then uh, we'll, we can close. And, 24. Um, and uh, I don't know how many of you noticed the mouse that ran by during the talk a little bit earlier. Yes, uh, a couple of people noticed uh, the mouse. 
Um, and uh, we'll uh, see you at the uh, February meeting.